European Union, Prava Justice, EU-led project, and also the United Nations um, Civil Society for Democracy project and human rights. Also, it is supported by the Minister of, of Global Affairs Canada and um, Rehabilitation Reform Package that is run by the coalition of different um, stakeholders and uh, donors. There is also a project that is involved here called the uh, Civil Society in Ukraine Initiative that is run under the partnership with the Ukrainian Independent Center of Political Studies and Democracy. So thanks very much to the Cabinet of Ministers of Ukraine for their contribution in organizing this forum. And because all this was initiated and launched by the Re Rehabilitation Reform Package, that's why the forum will be open to the future panelist today, co-chair of the RPR Coalition, Yulia Ruchana. Thank you. Dear participants of the Today's Reforms Dialogue, I have an honor to open one of the most important activities today, which demonstrates cooperation of civil society, Ukrainian government, and our international partners. First of all, I'm so much grateful to Lithuania for this country's support that we have been enjoying for quite a while especially in the conditions of the armed aggression that we suffer from. Thanks to Lithuania for um, actually building democracy and supporting democratic movement in Ukraine. We're so much grateful to the Lithuanian embassy for, the, for its support in organizing the today's. I want to remind you that those dialogues will be taking place from the 17th of November till November the 27th. And we're going to discuss some very important issues throughout the panel discussions that we're going to have. We're going to discuss the reforms agenda. And I'd like to actually ask everybody to be very constructive and speak without any populism. Let us talk openly about the challenges in Ukraine and possible solutions as well. Let us talk about poor constitutional culture. Let us think what we can do to contribute to the reforms agenda in the times of pandemic. How do we deter and resist Russian Federation, Federation's aggression? How do we make sure we're strong enough and to be part of the democratic transformation in this part of the world? So thank you very much for your attention. And let us start our today's forum. We have already started it. So I think you set the right goals. And hopefully, we're going to be able to actually discuss all the, the issues on the agenda as we initially planned. Of course, we would like to hear not only the welcoming remarks, but also uh, some of the insights um, about our future work. And let's give the floor to Linus Linkevichus. He's going to take the floor now. This is the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Lithuania. I want to remind you that we have the chat function here on Zoom. So you can actually use the chat and um, ask whatever questions you want. And then those questions will be moderated and you're going to get an answer. First of all, we can listen to Linus Linkevichus and then uh, you can act actually ask questions. Foreign Minister, you have the floor. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate for this opportunity. I'm really glad to welcome all participants of the conference uh, dialogue on reforms. And uh, as you can see in National Vilnius, it's indeed a very important procedure. But uh, we uh, we regret that we couldn't we couldn't organize this conference as as planned this year in Vilnius. But I believe uh, pandemics or any other obstacle cannot cannot prevent us from continuing uh, the process. And I have no doubt that this chain of conferences, which started 
in London, then in Copenhagen, then was very successfully organized in Toronto. Uh, next stop is Vilnius next year as agreed. And we already have uh, again another, another sort of venue in Switzerland. So this is exactly what we need. We need not just conferences uh, to taking part uh, once per year, but we definitely needed a process in between uh, to sustain, to, 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 to supervise, uh, to, to stay in touch uh, among experts. And this is exactly how we are considering this, uh, this to happen. So uh, really very important uh, that we will, uh, all stakeholders be consolidated support of, of, of the reform agenda. Uh, also, we know that uh, all institutions, including financial institutions like EBRD, EIB, uh, World Bank, they have their, their own experience and all mechanisms of supervising the process and really some benchmarks, how they will be measured, how assistance will be provided, how conditional, very important to note, uh, it's, it's going to, to, to take place. And, uh, and this is exactly to, important to merge, to make it overarching. Um, to consolidate our, our, our forces. Uh, today we will talk about other aspects, definitely, and security is not excluded, uh, but uh, now I'm talking about just economic dimension, which is not, not least important. And regardless the problems, regardless pandemics, regardless uh, Russian aggression against Ukraine, uh, nobody can call off all these, so to say, need to, to conduct reforms, and this is important to note. Uh, there's a wide and rich spectrum of all of them, and we definitely have very good record uh, on, on that. And I believe it's very important not to lose sight, first of all. Also to neutralize uh, possible uh, feelings of Ukrainian fatigue, was can say, among other, other partners and allies, which is not a big secret because a lot of challenges around, a lot of problems, and sometimes it's really concerned. We, we are concerned as well that we are sometimes losing the sight. It's important to keep it moving. The best argument uh, to, to deny all this uh, skepticism would be uh, forms on the ground, tangible, visible, and clear. And uh, I would like to single out one of the most important maybe achievements lately, which was, which was noticed by everyone, uh, Rada's decision to approve banking and land reforms. Uh, also, we, we, we are concerned about some other developments, and I believe we will touch uh, during this discussion, especially we can, can see that Constitutional Court is threatening to dismantle reform agenda. So, uh, also when we're talking about judicial reform, about anti-corruption measures, uh, reform of law enforcement agencies, uh, that uh, deserves, deserves definitely our particular attention. We have to understand that uh, this reversal of reforms, uh, I would repeat, land and banking reform and others, they could have, could have, could have, serious, uh, could have serious consequences for Ukraine's future cooperation with the international community, not only with the European Union. And we really at least would like to wish uh, for, to happen. Uh, when we're talking about uh, any, any, any aspect deserves special focus and uh, spe special attention. And when we're talking, for instance, about public administration reform, currently the largest single uh, area of bilateral EU support as uh, without uh, efficient civil service implementation of reforms impossible. Uh, progress uh, has, has been made uh, in the adoption of the relevant legislation uh, in tax and customs area. Uh, also very impressive uh, effort in digital transformation, just to mention. Uh, uh, positive trends uh, on the reform agenda and reform and decentralization is undoubtedly a huge breakthrough uh, for Ukraine such a huge country, the tra traditions, and to change this immediately, it's really difficult, or maybe even not possible, but we really can see this breakthrough, as I'd say, uh, at least with regard to the efforts and motivations. Important reform uh, of the health care system is underway. Uh, let's mention also defense sector reform. Uh, uh, needless to say how, how it's important, not with regard to the efficiency of the system, but also uh, having in mind transparency and, uh, and uh, which is really crucial in order to sustain uh, continuation of the of the backup and support by, by other, other organizations. So uh, in, in short, uh, I believe our task really to take stock, first of all, regardless of difficult time and uh, situation we all facing, uh, not to stop and to continue, really to uh, 
create further this networking among points of contacts who will be in touch, not only during the conferences, but as I said, in between. They use the best practice, which already proved to be right approach. And as I already said, not once, uh, Lithuania and other partners will not just stand by, as we can say, but really will be proactive and will be engaged. So I believe everything is uh, affordable. Everything is possible. Uh, the failure is not the option. And I have no doubt uh, we will proceed uh, further after all, all these conferences will end up and we'll find some follow-up uh, process, which is uh, also very important to, to fix. And uh, that's exactly what we expect to happen. So very, very much, thank you very much for the opportunity to organize, uh, to talk, uh, looking forward for more, more candid and open discussion. Maybe we'll be able to exchange on more particular specific areas. Uh, uh, later during the discussion, and uh, and I'm I'm really wish all participants uh, very fruitful exchange. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Foreign Minister, and indeed, your statement already triggered a lot of questions from the audience, and we keep uh, receiving the questions, and hopefully we're going to build a very productive dialogue. Actually, Lina Kirichenko's and Linus Linkavich's statements are very important, and we already started th this discussion. And there are some of the issues that are so much important on our agenda, which Foreign Minister already underlined. But actually, um, here we can see that the number of participants has grown by 27%. I even calculated that. That's not a frequent thing that happens every day. Now let us move to the formal official opening of the conference, which is called panel discussion on the current status and priority of reforms implementation in Ukraine. Let me remind you that we expect participation of the Ukraine's prime minister now, Denis Shmihal, and, Ol and Olha Stefanishina, vice prime minister for European and Euro-Atlantic integration of Ukraine. They're both now in the parliament answering questions asked by MPs. The floor is given to Katerina, Katerina Moternova, deputy chief of the um, DG, director general for neighborhood and enlargement policy. Katerina, please, you have the floor. You're gonna have 10 minutes for your statement. In case you need more time, let us know. And, and you can also answer some questions if you have. All right, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Dobre, duže dobre, very well. We hear okay. you very well. Excellent. Uh, well, uh, thank you very much uh, for inviting me. And it is a real honor and a distinct pleasure to be a uh, part of the Ukraine Reform Conference. I have followed uh, the first one in, in London and then in Copenhagen and was also in uh, Toronto uh, last year. So it's really great that despite not being able to be in Vilnius, we actually are able to do it, uh, do it online. And I wish uh, everyone uh, to stay away from the virus and those who got it to speedy recovery in this sense also to President Zelensky and, and other our friends in Ukraine that are struggling with the, with the virus, uh, really speedy, speedy recovery. I think that this is one of, uh, from where I stand and I, in addition to being the Deputy Director General in, the, in, in our Director General for Neighborhood and Enlargement uh, Policy, I'm also have been acting uh, thanks to the virus, in fact, uh, have been acting as the head of the support group for Ukraine. And uh, I find the uh, annual conference that is in addition to the yearly EU-Ukraine summit and the Association Council and the Association Committee that we have, I think one of the most uh, sort of substantive uh, uh, times and platforms for engagement uh, with the Ukrainian authorities and many of its uh, friends and allies. And it's really a distinct pleasure to speak after uh, Linas Linkevicius, who has been uh, a very vocal uh, a friend uh, and constructive friend of uh, Ukraine uh, in his personal as well as official uh, capacity. Um, 
this week uh, we commemorate seven years since the start of Maidan. So I think it's a really very nice reminder of the great sacrifices that Ukrainians have made in choosing the European path and all the reforms that uh, that uh, in entails. And I think that since the revolution of dignity in 2014, there has been a very uh, not easy, very difficult, sometimes windy, but very clear path for transforming the institutions, the economy, the society, and moving Ukraine uh, closer to Europe than ever in its, uh, in its history. I think there are, there are notable achievements that we can talk about. We can talk about the really remarkable stabilization of the economy, cleaning up of the banking sector, the huge energy reforms, uh, uh, including the the you know the the one we were pushing for and now we even forget to mention the unbundling of the na nafta gas the establishment of the anti-corruption framework uh, one reform that i always say is really changing the face of the country uh, across its territory which is the decentralization reform uh, also great strides in setting up a comprehensive public administration uh, reform and last but not least uh, really working within the context of our support but 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 really also learning from the very vibrant uh, civil society that exists in uh, in uh, in ukraine so i think that one needs to one needs to recognize this very much and and uh we now have uh, let's realize that only a year and a half of uh, the of the uh, two governments under under President Zelensky, whose first path in the office was uh, what uh, everybody called the turbo regime, and 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 some of us even were saying that the reforms are happening too quickly, and then pandemic hit. But despite that, uh, there have been uh, notable uh, achievements, as Linas was also mentioning, the banking resolution law, recriminalization of illicit enrichment, setting up of the high anti-corruption court, land reform, as I mentioned already, the unbundling of uh, nafta gas. Um, so these are really important, uh, important steps. But I don't think we would be good friends of Ukraine if we also didn't point out uh, to uh, the uh, perhaps some hesitations on the reform path, uh, including also more recently, uh, very, very systematic attacks on some of these reforms. And while those who study institutional economics and, and, and reformology, as is known in, in some circles, would always say that there is nothing like a perfect reform. There is nothing like reform that is uh, a reversal proof and reversal always can happen. I mean, we can just look uh, at the European Union, we can look at the United States, things that were held as, as given and set in stone suddenly are reversed. So there is nothing like uh, a, a reversal proof reform, but what we, what we can do and what we try to do from the European Union is to really push for the strength of institutions and tr strength of the building blocks that would help uh, against unraveling reforms. And what we are, what we are uh, currently uh, experiencing and what we are currently seeing right now is uh, in fact uh, a constitutional dilemma that the country is in. We have a situation where, uh, where uh, the highest court in the land uh, put, into, put into question uh, the, the uh, not put into question, essentially eliminated uh, one of the key tenants of the on, of the anti-corruption uh, architecture that had been uh, set up with the uh, great collaboration of Ukrainian authorities, international partners, domestic civil uh, society actors, and that was the asset declarations and criminalization of false asset declaration. And so right now the country is in a in a bit of a dilemma. How do you deal with a situation that goes against your constitution and you have the highest court in the land uh, voting on this? Not an easy answer, 
not a, not a straightforward and, and easy way out, but I think that with a series of, uh, of steps, how to address it, because there is no one silver bullet, I think one can, one can find a way and find a path out through a relaunch of comprehensive uh, uh, judicial reform that would address uh, uh, the different uh, different elements uh, elements of this, and I think that uh, I can certainly speak uh, for the for the EU, but also a number of our international partners that the international community is here to here to uh, help uh, Ukraine find uh, find way out of of this uh, of this really uh, an important uh, dilemma. Uh, what uh, let me now turn a little bit to to COVID and just uh, mention that uh, that uh, we are all we are all in this together, the whole world, and we are suffering from the from the same uh, impact. So is uh, so is Ukraine, and this is an area where the EU has uh, really tried to step up and not look only at its own problems, but uh, roll out assistance. To, to countries uh, around the world, and Ukraine has been certainly one of our key uh, one of our uh, key partners uh, in this. Back in back in April, we in fact uh, have put together a very solid package of uh, 190 million euros to to uh, uh, to shape our response both in terms of support with medical equipment and immediate needs, but also to help. Uh, with the economic uh, recovery out of it, we have uh, made Ukraine as uh, as one of as the only country from the neighborhood east or south uh, members of our medical medical emergency uh, committee, uh, and uh, we also are supporting the the provision of the vaccines through the Covax facility. Uh, by by a large contribution that is also going for the benefit of the neighborhood and not, uh, that means also uh, Ukraine as well. Um, we have also uh, come out of a fairly very not fairly sorry very successful summit back in uh, back in October that uh, reinforced the 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 message that as Ukraine is a very solid partner to EU. EU. EU is a very solid partner of uh, Ukraine and that we very much have an interest to continue uh, deepening and, and, uh, and, and implementing the association agreement and the uh, deep and comprehensive free trade area. The EU is already the number one trading partner of uh, Ukraine and uh, we are right now in very uh, active discussions on 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 how to how to uh, review and, and and modernize this uh, this agreement. Um, we are kicking off uh, a, a dialogue, uh, Vice President Timmermans and uh, Prime Minister Schmihal on on a Green Deal to see how Ukraine can 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 be uh, sort of inspired inspired by what's happening in Europe in its very important uh, green transition that's important for the Ukrainian economy. And we are very much looking forward also to signing the civil aviation agreement uh, early in uh, 2000, 2021. Um, so it's I would like to just, it's, uh, it's I'm time finishing, to this is my last sentence. This is my last sentence uh, that uh, uh, I just very much hope that we can continue on this very active uh, path. And uh, just to quote uh, High Representative Vice President Borrell, Ukrainian security is European security. I would say Ukrainian interests are Euro European interests. And I very much uh, look forward to, uh, to this conference uh, uh, being an important milestone in this regard. Thank you so much. We are we are together here, like Katerina Maternova just said, and this is once again confirming that we are on the right track together. She also mentioned that the decentralization reform is changing the country's face. Reforms are not only changing the country's face, but they are changing mindsets. So hopefully, this is going to also change our modus operandi. 
So how do international partners assess Ukraine's progress and whatever they can do to actually increase and enhance Ukraine's capacity? We're going to give the floor to Pavlo Grod. Thank you. Dear friends, Drihidruzi, uh, it is my great pleasure to participate in this opening panel forum conference. I want to thank, first of all, all friends of Ukraine, uh, last year's organizers in my home country, Canada, uh, uh, that frankly celebrate being Ukrainian in Canada. I want to thank, uh, uh, in particular, Lithuania's leadership and Minister Linkovicius uh, for, for your leadership on, on the international stage. Um, Ukraine has many assets, uh, its land, its resources, and its values, European values, values of freedom, democracy, and respect for human dignity. And we have to appreciate that those are values that are we're starting to see pop up in countries like Belarus, and those need to be supported today as it goes through its own difficult transition. But a key asset of Ukraine are its international partners, and I would like to highlight uh, the global Ukrainian diaspora, its international allies, and its friends of Ukraine, uh, many of which have gathered, many of who have gathered here today uh, on this panel and, and, on, and on upcoming panels. The Ukrainian World Congress is a umbrella organization which for over 50 years has uh, coordinated and represented the interests of today, over 20 million Ukrainians living in over 65 countries around the world. We have offices in Toronto, Kyiv, uh, Brussels, where we have a representation to the Europe in the European Union, and in New York, where we have a representation to the United Nations. We are in, we are independent of any government. We uh, and we hold that very true because we represent the interest of the Ukrainian people, the Ukrainian diaspora, uh, independent. So, at some points, we have to be able to support the work of the Ukrainian government. In some cases, we have to be able to and prepared to uh, provide them with constructive criticism. Uh, Ukra the Ukrainian World Congress, we've supported Ukraine's reforms, starting with supporting Ukraine's right to self-determination. We have supported Ukraine at all levels, whether they be humanitarian through numbers of projects, whether they be medical or reform projects, uh, democracy projects with we're respecting and supporting the electoral reforms, uh, election observation missions. We've been very active in supporting Ukraine's national identity. But perhaps uh, most importantly, we've also been very active in working with our respective governments around the world in those 65 countries that I've mentioned in order to be able to support Ukraine and help those countries uh, not only understand Ukraine, but also understand what are the key areas where they need to focus in terms of supporting Ukraine. And this is why I congratulate the, the, the founders and the organizers of this Ukraine Reform Conference, because it's, it's a really critical annual gathering where we have an opportunity to discuss key aspects that are important for Ukraine and set priorities and calibrate our priorities for where we need to focus our energies. And this is not necessarily just a session to provide Ukraine with our perspectives on where Ukraine should be going, but also amongst ourselves, amongst the international partners and friends of Ukraine, coordinate how we can best support Ukraine as it's going through its difficult reform process as it's trying to uh, uh, reform its economy while fighting a, a war on its eastern front. Uh, the Ukrainian World Congress uh, supports the uh, statement uh, by the G7 ambassadors, the G7 priorities for 2020, and I'm not going to read through them. I think that there is an a, a excellent and comprehensive list of important uh, reform agenda items, and I think it certainly provides an excellent roadmap for, uh, for, for Ukraine and also for the international community in terms of where we should be focusing our efforts to, to support Ukraine. Uh, I'd like to uh, touch on briefly Ukraine's economy. As we all know, it is key to its success and to its sovereignty. Uh, and the Ukrainian World Congress through its uh, council called the Economic Prosperity and Investment Council, EPIC, which is chaired by uh, uh, um, uh, CEO of the Ukraine of the Horizon Capital, uh, Ms. Lena Gozarny, and a Vice President of the Ukrainian World Congress. Uh, we attempt to, to uh, create opportunities to promote uh, investment, both within the international community and also within the diaspora community. Uh, there, the, 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 the amount of money that comes back to Ukraine from diaspora communities is staggering. 
it is over $10 billion annually that comes back to the Ukrainian economy through, uh, th through, the, through the Ukrainian communities, whether they be uh, immigrant workers or otherwise. And uh, there's a huge investment potential there. But, and we also know that you know, economic security is the bedrock of any nation's national security and stability. And a strong, strong economy is a pre prerequisite for a strong military to deter uh, the Russian uh, Federation and other actors, uh, uh, and also to protect Ukraine's sovereignty. Uh, but to attract investment at all levels, including foreign direct investment, uh, capital equity markets, the retail sector, Ukraine needs uh, 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 to concentrate on a business climate of stability and predictability, uh, transparency of process, rule of law. We can't focus on temporary fixes because they're not the long-term solution. We need systemic and coordinated transformation. Uh, we also need to see a stronger outreach to the diaspora and mechanisms for enabling investment and cooperation needs to be needs to be strengthened. That's something that the Ukrainian World Congress is working closely with uh, the cabinet of ministers, with the minister of foreign affairs, um, and with uh, and with communities around the world in order to create uh, chambers of commerce, in order to uh, encourage Ukrainian entrepreneurs to return back, and also to help. Ukrainians, uh, Ukrainian business find new uh, new markets and new channels. And um, what's really uh, critical in, in this process of, uh, of economic reform is again, the, the protection of transparency and regulatory policy uh, for investment. It can't be based on individual commitments, whether they be by the president, the prime minister or ministers, because as investors, they all know uh, these individuals come and go. But Ukraine needs investors that are there for the long term. Uh, and the same can be said about privatizations. Otherwise, these investors will be attracted, the, the, otherwise, the investors that will be attracted to Ukraine will be the likes of the Russian oligarchs who are, uh, who are, who are comfortable operating in shadowy regimes or investors that are in it for a quick buck, with, as, as a result, will expect to extract huge premiums on their returns. And all this will simply harm the citizens of Ukraine who will eventually have to pay for that risk premium. Uh, one of the key aspects of this diaspora engagement, which I'd like to spend a little bit more time talking about, is creating an environment that is, that is conducive for, for engaging uh, uh, Ukrainians from abroad. And that is one area that we are strongly advocating for, and that is a, a, a law on citizenship that would allow for global Ukrainians to become citizens. Many in Ukraine refer to this as uh, a dual citizenship. And we've seen many, many examples of diaspora Ukrainians coming back to Ukraine, such as Uyanda Suprun, Natalia Eresko, Danilo Bilak, and uh, Lena Kozharny, who, who have contributed so, so importantly to Ukraine's development. And we need to see more of that. And uh, we should look to uh, friends of ours, whether it be the Baltic countries, the Eastern European countries, that have successfully engaged their diaspora in helping to reform Ukraine. But what is really critical in this is not the, not the bill that was introduced most recently, but that doesn't allow for uh, participation in, in civil service, um, because that is critical, uh, in allowing and in encouraging the Ukrainian global community to engage in civil service to help build a stronger, uh, a stronger country is, is critical. Uh, I just want to uh, conclude on, um, on, on the discussion about the constitutional crisis. Um, what's critical in, in this discussion, this so-called constitutional cr crisis, it is really a symptom of what constitutes the root, root cause of uh, Ukraine's increasing challenge to reform. Uh, that is the lack of a reformed, totally independent judicial system. It's not simply at the top, it's right through the entire system independent from the influence of the powerful oligarchs, as well as Kremlin lobbyists in the Rada, media and institutions. It needs to be independent from government or presidential agendas. And as long as the rule of law is not fully integrated into Ukraine's system, it is illusory to envision irreversible uh, progress. Uh, corrupt judges can at any time, and demonstrated currently, roll back reforms that Ukraine needs to become the, the state that it says it wants to become. And rule of law and respect of legal procedures are key. 
uh, indeed, had the legal uh, procedures to establish the anti-corruption body has been followed during this and previous presidencies, today's constitutional crisis would simply not have been possible. The no rule of law, no economic process, no uh, foreign investment, no means of fighting corruption at all levels. Um, so what, what is key, and I'd like to leave you with this, with this final message, is that uh, today uh, Ukraine needs a clear roadmap from, in particular, uh, its Euro-Atlantic partners. It needs a clear roadmap to uh, EU membership. It needs a clear roadmap to NATO membership. It's a long road ahead, but uh, right now, uh, unfortunately, Ukraine's not getting the right signals it needs for that clear, clear path. And with that clear path, that will ensure that Ukraine stays on its reform trajectory. Uh, we know today that Ukraine is not a monolith. There are many actors- Mr. Grod, it's time to wrap up, really. I will, thank you. And I will conclude on this. As I said, Ukraine is not a monolith. Uh, many forces are acting in certain, either A, pure self-interest, or, or they're, they're working to undermine Ukraine's success. So in conclusion, I want to thank uh, our international friends, uh, like Minister Dinkevichus, uh, like uh, Member of, uh, of Parliament Katerina Katrina Maternova, and I'm confident that we will soon be looking back at these conferences and various events that have been critical to Ukraine's success as a prosperous, independent, democratic European country. Thank you very much. Slavo Kurieni. Thank you, Mr. Grod. And uh, as a constructive critic, you mentioned, you said that um, I'm leaving you with uh, the message, but we know that uh, you are not leaving us, you are staying, in fact, with us, but during this uh, conference, not only during this conference, but also for a longer period, and not only you, but also a lot of Ukrainians all around the world. Yes, you are right that the uh, pass is a long one, but we should... Uh, Remember that the road to uh, Vilnius is a great part uh, on this way. And now we are moving to Yulia Kirichenko, who is the co-chair of the RPR coalition board. I am passing the floor to you. And please react to what you have heard. Please uh, tell us about uh, the uh, status and their perspective. And we do remember from time to uh, time to time that uh, so uh, the Ukrainian word uh, uh, what matters. So uh, what does matter to you? So I am taking my ten minutes. So from what uh, other speakers uh, had used uh, their ten minutes, you have twelve minutes. So the pr priorities uh, of the reform in Ukraine from the civil society uh, and uh, our uh, RPR council board, uh, and we have 26 organizations who are acting in different areas. We would like to say that, first of all, and uh, with the, the events which happened in October and September, we would like to talk about uh, the um, applicability of the Constitution of Ukraine. We should look closer uh, that uh, the Constitution is not uh, applicable uh, in practice. And also we should speak uh, about the constitutional culture of different uh, state authorities. And we should be frank, uh, speaking uh, not only about the institutions, but also of the society as well. So what are the priorities which we see? First of all, we have to answer for us, for Ukrainian society and for uh, our powers. Is the Constitution a value? Will we allow to violate? And uh, if we speak about uh, the 96 uh, reading of the Constitution, did we like it? Uh, oh, so will this uh, protect us from the usurpation of uh, power? Will it allow us uh, to uh, have the reforms which we are aiming at? Will it protect uh, the constitution and the society? And uh, we should be sincere. We should look at the constitutional reform together with the decentralization reform 
which uh, is still uh, going on due to the constitutional amendment. Maybe we should join them uh, with uh, the reform uh, of the uh, power in Ukraine. So after the revolution of dignity, we haven't fulfilled this task. We were not talking uh, to the specific uh, people. We were speaking to about the, the mechanism of the power, uh, which uh, in fact, uh, uh, made it possible uh, to change uh, the direction in which we are uh, moving forward. In 2014, the parliament promised that the constitutional reform will be held and that the parliament uh, will uh, gain more powers and that decentralization uh, will be uh, in the constitution uh, secured. Then we should look at the legislation. We should look uh, in a detailed way. We have a number of laws and bylaws which, uh, in fact, contradict the Constitution. And in every reform, we should answer, uh, do we have uh, any uh, violations of the Constitution or so on? As we, for example, had uh, with the anti-corruption uh, authorities a lot uh, of new institutions and authorities uh, were established with violation of a uh, constitution or with some constitutional drawbacks. And then we can see uh, that if uh, the reforms uh, have the constitutional drawbacks, uh, then the reforms are ruined uh, by themselves. And we do not understand what is the issue. So now we, uh, should review the powers uh, of the branches uh, of the president and then to align them with the constitution and to uh, build a constitutional background for the anti-corruption um, authorities and bodies and the anti-corruption uh, reform is now linked with the, the constitution uh, court and uh, I do not uh, call it uh, the constitutional crisis, but it's a constitutional judiciary crisis. But what is the answer of the civil society to this issue? Unfortunately, 24 draft laws which are registered in the parliament do not give the right answer what we should do at this state. And the right uh, answer is, is uh, to have uh, a new uh, judicial uh, constitutional court uh, which will not uh, be uh, dependent on any branch of the power. So we first had a good uh, idea uh, of uh, selecting the constitutional uh, judges in a very uh, transparent uh, way. But then the parliament did not uh, vote uh, for uh, this uh, way uh, of uh, finding the judge. And now the judges of the Constitution Court could be employed in a political way. Then we cannot be sure that uh, this court will act in a fair way and will protect the Constitution. Of course, the society cannot trust. That's why none of the draft laws in the parliament is setting uh, the specialized commission which will be able to have this transparent way of finding judges uh, with uh, two provisions, a high moral values and high professional level. The political such as the parliament and the person, the president should not be involved in this. So the way out of the constitutional crisis should be an independent selection commission. And the last week we had discussions with different NGOs and we came to the conclusion that it could be good to suggest for the retired uh, judges uh, who were appointed uh, in 96 
when the power did not understand uh, how the constitutional uh, court could be used for their own interest. That's why uh, those uh, judges, uh, uh, in fact, know uh, what uh, should be uh, the features and characteristics uh, of the newly uh, selected uh, judges, because at that point, uh, the, uh, the judges were appointed uh, those with the best qualities. So what are our priorities? When we look at the Constitution at its applicability, we are speaking about uh, good governance. And we should indicate that the government is finally preparing a comprehensive document, the strategy uh, of uh, governance reform. And we are supporting this and we are asking the government, when you are drafting this strategy, please uh, do it uh, in a comprehensive way and uh, to fulfill two tasks. First is to come back to the civil servant where there will be no political uh, retirement and where the civil servant will be protected and also to come back to the competitions to uh, the which uh, in fact were introduced and were very effective but then they were cancelled and the second point is that the minister should be capable uh, to uh, provide and draft uh, policies. I know that the Ministry of Justice and the Parliament are doing this, and they should adopt uh, the legislation about the bylaws, what institutions and subjects uh, could uh, introduce the bylaws which uh, are uh, which should be enforced for everyone. So we, if we are speaking about the bylaws, we should understand what are the institutions uh, uh, with the uh, authorities uh, to create uh, those bylaws. Then uh, the power uh, of uh, nation, and that's uh, the topic which is discussed in the last uh, year. But what do we understand about this notion? So our answer is that it should be uh, the democratic procedure of holding the referendum. And also in this way, the constitution should be applicable as well. And from 2018, we do not have pan-Ukrainian referendum because the constitutional uh, court decided uh, on the law uh, on uh, pan-Ukrainian referendum. Uh, and we are very grateful to the uh, constitutional court for this because it was a scenario uh, from Russia. And uh, the most efficient method would be uh, to have the local referendum and we are thankful uh, to the parliament for uh, drafting the legislation for the uh, pan-Ukrainian referendum, and we hope that it will be adopted in this autumn. And uh, further, we would ask to draft uh, the legislation uh, on uh, the local referendum, because uh, in the regions, uh, the voters uh, can decide on the regional topics uh, and uh, they should have forced to um, counter the actions of the local um, administrations. The judicial reform is the next topic. Of course, it's a, a long uh, road and a lot of mistakes uh, has have been taken. But two answers uh, are quite obvious what should be done further. First of all, the court administration and uh, courts uh, should uh, have the integral uh, persons with integrity uh, who would provide uh, a very professional, in a very professional way, selection uh, of uh, employees, of uh, judges. We believe that it should be a one comprehensive law which will provide the in, uh, higher 
the uh, High Council uh, of Justice uh, should uh, have very integral uh, members. We uh, understand that communication about the reforms, what have been done uh, and what we should do is a very important step. And uh, without communication, no reforms uh, could move forward. The state should do everything possible to provide uh, the possibility for the uh, state broadcaster to provide the information. The information should be provided uh, in a balanced way, uh, unbiasedly, about the reforms and both positive and negative uh, um, aspects. Uh, I mean the pandemic situation, because when we have this uh, political channel, so we uh, are lost. Uh, where to find uh, the truthful information. Uh, that's why the state uh, broadcaster is a priority, one, in fact, of the priorities uh, for the reform. Uh, thanks a lot. It should inspire the uh, representatives of the state broadcaster uh, who are participating in our conference. Uh, I will add just uh, some points. The state, of course, should, but without the involvement uh, of the audience, the state will be doing it in a very long way. That's why uh, I am saying that everyone who is watching and looking, please support the state broadcasters. Of course, there will be uh, some mistakes, uh, some wrong steps. Please support. And now uh, the vice president on the European uh, integration, name is uh, Olaf Stefanishna. Maybe you were informed that you have only 10 minutes, but uh, in fact, you will have 12 minutes because everyone uh, had 12. So please tell us what is uh, happening in the parliament. Dear colleagues, here I'm feeling at home because with me, communication with uh, the NGOs, uh, with uh, the representatives of the broadcasting is a, a challenge, but also an inspiration. And uh, secondly, I see the uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs of uh, Lithuania, uh, who became an inspiration uh, for holding the next round of uh, the uh, reforms. And for the two years, uh, it's, uh, in fact, an uh, unprecedented uh, case. He is uh, very sustainable in his position. And when we are communicating with RPR, with our international partners, with uh, with Linus uh, personally, with the right, in fact, uh, some topics so we are not uh, even discussing because uh, we understand uh, uh, each other without words. And uh, in fact, uh, it's a very uh, good uh, way how we should uh, communicate. So, uh, Linus, uh, I see that uh, I saw that you were present here and I'm very happy that today we had the possibility to talk. Uh, we had uh, a, a challenge that the, the uh, government uh, was um, that government came to the uh, parliament. We had uh, to report what we are doing to uh, fight uh, the uh, pandemic uh, situation in Ukraine. Of course, the, the uh, perception of our actions, how to fight it is uh, not uh, considered uh, only in a positive way. I'm a person who is looking at uh, the situation uh, in a realistic way. I'm uh, telling the truth. And from my professional life, uh, I was negotiating and uh, I do believe that there are not only black and white sides. Uh, there are, of course, uh, some uh, reforms which are perceived in a good way uh, by the society, uh, by the NGOs, uh, but there are also other cases. Now, we can speak about the judicial reform from different points, uh, but uh, the 
constitutional uh, court which was uh, reformed in a very good way but then the decision of the constitutional court is uh, putting at stake uh, in fact uh, the security of ukraine of course there are no ideal solutions and decisions and uh, the president uh, gave uh, the task to the parliament to find the uh, solution how to uh, reload uh, the constitutional uh, court. I, won, I was one of the uh, per, uh, one of the members uh, who uh, submitted the idea of uh, finding the new members. But I do believe that now it's very critical uh, not to wait uh, for the uh, good uh, legislation, but the selection commission could be a much faster uh, solution. Uh, and uh, in fact, I was uh, criticized uh, for a, a long uh, uh, for, from a, a number of people uh, because I said uh, that we should reload uh, the uh, constitutional uh, court uh, with the new members uh, and uh, um, the idea that there are of course uh, transparent and integral uh, members in the judicial uh, system and uh, we uh, also should understand that it's a very comprehensive uh, uh, idea and uh, i uh, remember rpr uh, as a um, institution uh, which uh, always provided uh, packages of remorse. In 2014, uh, we do remember uh, that uh, the uh, RPRs uh, provided uh, different packages uh, for different areas. That's why uh, um, uh, I would like to ask you um, also in uh, this uh, time also to provide those uh, package reforms. The new reality of which we uh, understand right now is the new information reality. And we should develop a critical thinking because uh, when we have different uh, channels with different owners, they are creating their own realities and uh, trying to influence with their own policies. And uh, I saw a number of speakers who will be joining the today's discussion, and I'm convinced that different ideas uh, will be heard to date uh, from critical to optimistic, but I will give you a number of uh, facts. When we're saying there, there, there is political hygiene. So this is about democracy. We're learning how to live in the pluralism of opinions and when you're trying to foster reforms you need to convince the others look for coalitions and seek support well if you're if we're going back to the last year's situation i believe we have built this coalition and found support in the land reform as well as the banking reform we have resumed the illicit precedes uh, criminalization. And there were, there were a lot of changes that had not been supported by the, in the previous political cycles, for they had been very difficult. And I, I remember when we were about to vote for the banking law, you couldn't never approach a single MP, they would actually disregard that. Same thing can be said about ourselves moving towards Europe. And, and this convocation of the parliament has already approved 20 laws that had been put on the shelf by the previous convocation. Like I already said, I, I was mentioning the uh, this financial market services split, the legislation and everything. Those were sectorally important things. And each of those legislations is to build the market build more competition based on democracy and European values that we so much aspire for. We no longer hear such messages as, okay, let's be members of the European Union and, and full stop. But we're trying to be practical now. There was an EU-Ukraine summit where for the first time ever in the last decade, and I can actually confirm that, 
we managed to reach political agreements regarding the association agreement and decisions were made about support from the European Union for Ukraine's decentralization reform, as well as judicial reform. We hadn't been in such a critical situation when the summit took place, but the president had a very affirmative opinion about the anti-corruption infrastructure to be as one of the key priorities. And this is one of the markers of Ukraine's transformation, which has to be, of course, pushed forward. And this opinion still stays. Similarly, when we were talking about the reforms and when I was getting ready for the today's statement, I was just thinking about what other country I would like to live in or be part of government or parliament in whatever country around the globe. I mean, there are countries who never talk about reforms, who never, their people may not know their prime minister's last name. They never watch political talk shows, but we are gradually moving towards the same situation. I can confidently say that in every government meeting, we really make decisions that do change lives of the people here in Ukraine. They are sometimes not very popular, they are sometimes lockdown related and people hate that, but it's very important that as, as a result of what we do, we are trying to build this in a systemic way. Same thing when talking about security and defense uh, sector and information hygiene. We many times heard that funding for defense was reduced for the last, for the next year's budget, but the Ministry of Defense's total budget is much bigger than ever in Ukraine. This is 6% of the GDP. And this is three times more than in some other countries, even NATO member states. We were talking a lot about the security and defense reform and our pursuit for Euro-Atlantic integration and today we can already see a huge effort being invested into the legislation on defense procurement. Already back in, before the 2020, we'd never known how defense procurement actually worked. And um, even some of the government members were not quite aware of how that system had worked before. Uh, is that my introduction, right? Yeah, or, or this is my statement. No, that's that's already the discussion that is underway. So yes, indeed, I, I really want us to have very good discussion here uh, about reforms primarily. And the only thing that I can assure you of that we always have been enjoying support from civil society and our international partners um, members of government and myself, we all train to build coalitions with the partners who can really contribute with their expertise, their experience and best practice. And I think this is one of the most efficient tools when we're talking about communicating with uh, the partners uh, in line with our European and Euro-Atlantic aspirations. I could not even imagine how one could build any kind of plans in the country without communicating with the international partners without their professionalism, expertise, and so much experience they've had. So I'm so much grateful to uh, the colleagues of mine from the government of Canada, because they were laughing at me when I first came to the government. They said, yes, we had already developed a good planning mechanism, so let us share it with you and you're gonna be using it in your daily work. And I said, I do apologize. We're not yet that developed. We're not ready for it yet. But then you understand that after two months, you can't move things forward. You just do something, but it'll bounce us back. So it's important to recognize, yes, there is an, some expertise somewhere which you should not neglect. And please be responsive to whatever people wanna share with you. And this way we can build positive transformation. That's why those package decisions are even better. 
So let me stop here at this point, and I'm going to be happy to hear any of your questions and as well as other remarks from our participants. Yes, we're going to have the discussion right now because um, the participants have already delivered their key messages. And um, Linus Linkavichus unfortunately had to leave us, but um, we are still so much grateful to him and also to Pablo Grod for your restless support. But we still have Pablo with us, president of the uh, World Congress. Of Ukraine. And I'm here too as well. Katarina is here as well. Oh, this is great. Thank you so much for this. There are a lot of questions actually. And one of those is related to what Yulia mentioned. We need to build a mechanism that will enable ourselves and provide, I mean, protect us. So should we create the mechanism that we will protect or should we create the mechanism that will protect ourselves? And like Yulia mentioned, maybe in the future, we're gonna build a set up an independent commission. Yes, there are a lot of people who expect something, but then in the end of the day, nothing happens. How do we incentivize all this? How do we incentivize and foster change? And one more, there's one more thing to what Olga Stefanishna said. Yes, I, I'm really supportive of your message that you just said regarding uh, the public broadcaster. I'm sure it should be not only public broadcaster on TV, but also on the radio, because radios are sometimes, I mean, radio signals sometimes they have even greater coverage than television. So we're going to listen to um, to you first, and then give the floor to Katarina Maternova and Pavlo Grod. How to incentivize all this? And my thinking is, I'm going to come back to the same message that the Ukrainian society and government that we have elected, unfortunately, never did the key thing that we expected them to do. We never reform central government agencies. We still have different baffling tasks, but uh, there should be a good balance between president, government, and parliament. We've been declaring this before, uh, during the revolution of dignity that we need to make our parliament stronger. And here is one more message that I missed, but still it is very important for me. We as a very vibrant civil society would like to listen to the political talk shows, but we don't want to listen to that populism. We want to listen to constructive, good, tangible debate where we understand not just, okay, this is prime minister speaking, that's it. We want to see the future behind whatever the prime minister is talking about. We don't want to see those rushing uh, political projects with very rapid financial campaigns. We would like to see sustainable political parties who have good representation. And here's another statement that I'd like to make. We would really encourage to see the new law on political parties that would incentivize the emergence of parties with good representation. Otherwise, we can never build a democratic state enough members have to support their political parties and know the party from the inside. And we need to also uh, encourage interpartisan democracy. The Venus Commission will up, up, update uh, its recommendations on uh, the law, on the legislation on political parties. And uh, I think we need to be developing our our parties, and the political party is not um, a private entity, but this is a, so to say, a, an organization aspiring for parliament. So 
so once again, I want to emphasize that this, this is not just an objective for, for one single year, but we need to be working closely on this, on inclusion, on good representation of political parties. And you mean this should be done in collaboration between government and, this, and society? No, I, you might understand me wrong, but um, I mean, it's not just the dialogue between government and society. We as a society, regardless of the pandemic risks or armed conflicts, we are ready to go for this new constitutional process to build a proper political system here in the country. Thanks very much, Yulia. And in some of the constitutional issues, uh, we still have a lot of questions about that too in our chat box. I'm, I'm sure those questions are important to be answered by all the participants. I want to encourage Katarina Maternova to share a comment about what you have just heard from the other panelists here. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry, is there a specific question or in general you want me to uh, react? Uh, yeah, generally what uh, you have heard, what is your reaction to what you have heard from other participants? Is it uh, everything that you could have predicted, but maybe there well, is something I would unexpected. like to I I would like to uh, kindly react on the uh, last uh, comment from uh, from the representative of uh, the the civil society. Um, just to just to say that uh, I very much uh, I very much uh, subscribe to the notion that uh, democracy and building of a political system and democratic uh, institutions transfer of power as we can see in the world today is something that's it's like uh, growing a plant you need to attend to it every day it's not something that is done and then is done forever and i think the all this modern democracy uh, across the atlantic are showing us this lesson very painfully uh, these days and so what i want to uh, encourage uh, Ukrainian both authorities and the civil society to keep at it. I think the idea of building uh, institutions, strong institutions, uh, is is a, is a must. In the course I teach on state building, governance, and reforms, uh, I always say that in order to have a functioning democratic society, the different elements need to be in harmony. You cannot have too strong a civil society and weak state institutions. That's not going to be no better than the other way around. So I think that this is uh, all I can say is encourage that uh, that we continue at it, but to be to be on the little bit positive side, despite the difficulties right now and the constitutional crisis that we are looking at uh, in Ukraine. Uh, let's look at the last two years. You have had two important elections. You had a year and a half uh, ago uh, presidential election, which uh, which which ended up in a in a model uh, democratic process and uh, and transition of power. You had uh, local elections. Now, I mean, you actually have set of elections in in Ukraine that I think you should be proud of. Uh, the fact that uh, yes, maybe the the parties are not the solidified. Yes, there is going to be a change. But look at look at countries. It's a process. It's a process everywhere. So add it. But I think you on the on the democratic uh, development side. I think there are achievements that uh, Ukraine should be uh, should be proud of. Now let's uh, let's uh, hopefully we will be able to collectively uh, uh, work out the path um, out of the the, the current uh, constitutional stalemate, uh, if you will, and uh, and relaunch the relaunch the anti-corruption architecture, and that you hopefully will be able to continue also the important structural reform agenda that uh, that uh, that is ahead of us but let's also remember the good things that uh, happen thanks thank you miss maternova so it is real really a constitutional path and uh, 
one of the panelists said, mm, life is never black and white. However, when we play chess, we have black and white figures. What will Pavlo Grod tell us about this? As for the reforms and this path, you understand that we always start from top to the bottom. We always look at the Constitutional Court. Like I, I mentioned already, it's important to see the full picture of the judicial reform, starting from the smallest courts to the Supreme Court, all the way upstairs. So the rule of law is challenging, but there must be the key priority set up because without the judicial reform in on every layer, on every tier, including those local courts, I can, I can see some of the challenging court cases. Without that, no social reforms can be, can be actually cherished, nor constitutional ones. If you allow me, I would like to share some of the comments regarding some other issues and statements made before. I'm fully supportive of what was said about the public broadcaster because the importance of the international awareness raising and information policy is not the role to be played by oligarchs and their media so we fully support this idea of the public broadcaster to change the ukrainian society's mindset about this i would also like to note like it was mentioned already that there are international expertise and Ukrainian uh, international experts. Ukraine does need international experts, but also Ukraine needs experts who are ready to get involved in economic, political and social reforms and development in the country. It's not only about reforms, the reforms are ongoing. But I'm calling upon creating all the possibilities to get the diaspora involved into this process. They are really real professionals, they're patriotic, they're ready to jump in and help a lot. That's why we really encourage the parliament to pass the law on dual citizenship. It is also important for us to understand that we have to be proud of some of the things. Very often we talk about challenges that are the most critical ones, but we also need to, need to look everywhere to see the whole picture. Yes, we did manage to keep some of the reforms, but Ukraine is not Russia and Ukraine is not Belarus. Ukrainians want to be part of the new world. That's why we need to actually show to the entire world that we are the nation of winners so that then, then the international partners will be eager to work with us. Otherwise, if they, can only, if they only hear about the challenges in Ukraine, they might lose this momentum. That's why we need to work on Ukraine's positive image. Of course, reforms are there. Of course, we're building this state. We need to, of course, look at that with more positive sight. Thank you so much, Pavlo. Uh, we have seven minutes to go, actually, until the panel discussion is over. So I'm going to try to, to um, build on what has been said and also uh, share some of the questions in the chat. The question there is that in since 1991, we started building um, the Ukrainian state, not on the foundation, but on the sand. Can you now confirm that we now have a reliable foundation that, that, to build the state? Or maybe we should actually demolish everything and start erecting something new. So first, uh, we're going to ask uh, Olga Stefanishina, and then Ms. Kirichenko, then Pavlo Grod. Well, I think it, it was the revolution of dignity that had really built the found representative of the whole of Ukraine. 
but we need to make sure this Ukraine's path is irreversible. We're not coming back, we're moving forward. Of course, this is a challenging process, isn't it? But I want to actually agree with a part of the government and parliament team. And I have a confidence that today we have a reliable foundation and it is a really solid one to be able to build something decent on it. Of, co of course, this process might have some hiccups and stumbling blocks on the way, but I'm sure there's no way back. Plus, Ukraine is already, already um, getting away from the old fashioned perception of itself as being just an actor in the region. There is a great inspiration to see Ukraine as one of the regional leaders. So I believe this is also an evidence that confirms that there is no way back. Uh, it should be strong and keep going forward. Thank you, thank you so much. Do we have the foundation? Is it solid enough? Indeed, yes. And this foundation is about the people. We've had so many challenges. We had abuse of power, and now we are passing this huge test that was actually imposed on us by the Russian Federation. Do we need to update our constitution? I believe yes, definitely so. Because you can see uh, the struggle in, at the constitutional court. Unfortunately, the reform that had been passed in or initiated in 2016 and was never unfortunately finished and never complete. But every government tried to build the constitutional court based on the political preferences only. And when we incorporated competition into the selection of judges together with the new requirements for integrity, professionalism and other qualities, all the judges must have. So the Unfortunately, they purged the some of the provisions in that article to the Constitution on the competition or the con contest commission to select uh, future justices. And then politicians will only appoint those who will be recommended. I think we have to make this process complete. And I think this recent decision shed some more light on the importance to do that. And just reloading the constitutional court politically, that's our answer is no to that. Thanks very much, Yulia. Pablo Grod, please. Thank you. I fully agree that the foundation is solid. The foundation, in, the core in the foundation are the people of Ukraine. So it's important for us to believe in ourselves. Unfortunately, what I can see is that there is a lot of hope for the government, whatever the government will do, whatever the president can do, but let us focus on what the civil society can do because this, this is key. U Ukraine could actually reverse back to its Soviet legacy, but people would stand up and say no to that. We are learning from our history this happened after the Orange Revolution, and to a certain extent, the same thing happened after the Revolution of Dignity, when there was a huge, uh, actually, resistance against reversing Ukraine back to the Soviet legacy. Ukrainians would stand up, and now they have won, and they gave everything away to the government to handle this. But unfortunately, this happens in Ukraine and people are fighting in Ukraine for its, for their independence. But it's also important that the people fight for the success of the reforms. They will, they have to fight for the Ukraine's success without waiting for someone else, for, the, for, for some personalities to actually fix everything for them. It's not the personalities that have to, to rescue Ukraine, neither the president nor the, the government or parliament. Ukraine needs to be built on the foundation of its peoples its institutions. That's why building the institutions is of crucial importance. Let's take a look at the developed economies in the world. 
they're not relying that much on the head head of state. They had been building have been building their foundations for many years. Katrina Maternova, please share some more remarks from your side, please. Um, well, look, I think that the transition from uh, the communist system into uh, market economy and uh, functioning democracy is a challenge and has been a challenge everywhere. I come from a country that uh, had to go through the same transition and it's in, in some respects is, uh, is, is still going on. Uh, and, uh, and as I said before, even very established democracies have to, have to keep at it. And so I wouldn't uh, say that it was built on sand. What I would say is that there are important milestones in the, uh, in the uh, building of a, of a solid state. And I, in my mind, uh, an extremely important milestone was indeed the revolution of dignity. And I think that what has been achieved since 2014 is, is exponentially more than has been achieved uh, during the 20 years before that. Uh, and, and, and I think, but, but, uh, but, uh, but the story is not over. And, uh, and um, many times since the many reforms were, were delayed for uh, until, until after uh, Maidan, uh, I always say that it's like bicycling up a hill with reforms. You can't stop midway because if you do, you fall back, you roll back. And I think we are right now in, the, in a situation which is really a, a, a turning point again. We have a constitutional crisis. One needs to find a way out of it. As I mentioned, the international community is here to here to understand and, and help, but it will require a recommitment to some of the fundamentals of, of, of the reforms that we perhaps taken for granted just a year ago or half a year ago. And uh, to, to make sure that even, even the, the, the rock that was built doesn't turn into the, into the sand. So I think we are still on a good path, but uh, right now we are at a critical juncture. Thank you so much, Ms. Maternova. Yes, life goes on and history never stops. So we're going to have take a break now and we are going to reconvene in 10 minutes for another panel discussion. Dear participants and panelists, I, would I just noticed that never anyone said a very popular word combination of Ukraine, political will. And if no one ever mentions political will, it means that there are things that are much more important than that. There's action, there is much better understanding of the current situation, and there's good thinking about how to be moving forward. So I know how challenging and difficult the way to Vilnius can be, because I had to once to travel to Riga back in the Soviet Union, and I couldn't get any train tickets. That's why I traveled to Vilnius on actually on a luggage shelf inside of the train car. And then after Vilnius, some of the people left, they would actually stepped out of the train and I could actually take a more comfortable seat. I can see August definition and once would like to say something and after this we're going to wrap up. I'm not going to make a, any political statements. I just realized that the way to Vilnius uh, sounds very symbolically because back in 2013 we'd been so far away from Vilnius in those days and it's so good. It's not good that we it, it's taking so much time for us to get to Vilnius. But still, we are building this Ukrainian future, or this Euro European future for Ukraine. And it's great that our colleagues from Lithuania have been restlessly supporting us and even suggest new solutions for Ukraine to the EU. Hopefully, this path will be not as challenging as the one that you mentioned before. Okay, God bless. Thanks.
Ну що ж, давайте почнемо. So let's start our second part, which is dedicated to the topic of European integration. And we will try to answer whether the glass of European Euro integration is full, half or full empty, or as someone said that the glass is broken. So we will have um, some expertise, and this is Olga Stefanishin, Deputy Prime Minister for European and Euro-Atlantic Integration. Also, we will have Ivana Klimpushtinsa, the MP, the head of the Parliament Committee on Ukraine's integration to the European Union. Also, we have Taras Kajka, the Deputy Minister of Economic Development, Trade and Agriculture Ukraine, Trade Representative Ukraine the Director General of the Directorate for Foreign Policy of the Office of the President, Andrei Bukrich. We also uh, have um, on Zoom, Amati Masikas, Head of the European Union Delegation, also by Skype, Veronika Movchan. Uh, she is the Head of the Center for Economic Studies Research Director. And also uh, here personally, Leonid Litra, the senior research fellow uh, at the new europe center so the key question where the european integration is moving what are the perspectives what are the tasks and what the government is set for us so olga let's start with you thank you yuri i think it will be logical to start with me as I can um, tell you more where the European integration of Ukraine is moving forward. Colleagues, we were speaking a lot in the previous panel about the reforms, how specific is uh, the idea of the uh, ideology. Um, and now we have no doubt that Europe and Euro-Atlantic integration is still uh, the same idea and process which unites uh, and uh, assists in moving forward the reform. The European integration today also means uh, that uh, Ukraine is collaborating with international partners and provides convergence uh, in uh, internal and external policy. And we can follow this uh, in the changes which we can track. And also the experts from the NGOs uh, can also tell this. When we will join the discussion and start speaking how uh, we are uh, facilitating the renewal of the association agreement and uh, how we are trying to involve Ukraine into the new green policy of the EU or starting other sectoral initiatives, we should first understand that we can talk about this because in the recent years, the, the topic of the Euro European integration in Ukraine was sustainable. In all the government, there were vice the ministers uh, on uh, euro integration the, there were institutional capacities and we can tell that right now we have a clear uh, roadmap and we know how to track this and we uh, have a developed um, state uh, authorities and also uh, specific uh, uh, members uh, who are responsible for implementation of this roadmap. We are quite ambitious uh, and uh, today we will discuss how we're going to move forward. The uh, recent summit uh, Ukraine-EU and the meeting uh, uh, which will uh, be held in December uh, that there was a very fruitful collaboration uh, in the recent uh, months. Uh, uh, and also still in 2019. That's why we have those uh, very positive outcomes. 
And if we speak about the routine day-to-day uh, -day, uh, way uh, to your integration, I, unfortunately, I cannot speak uh, speak uh, both uh, about your integration and your Atlantic integration. Uh, that's why I will speak uh, in this panel. So as we are sustainable on our way, we uh, can be more ambitious and even to play a greater role uh, in the international uh, arena. So we can feel ourselves a full-fledged member of the European community. I already mentioned this in the previous panel. I'm convinced that the European community is willing to see Ukraine not only a successful uh, country with uh, a high development of economics, but rather as a leader in the region, which uh, shows uh, where to move and uh, which unites around it uh, other neighboring countries. So when uh, I'm speaking about the transformation, about the negotiations which uh, we uh, have with the EU, I can also see a, a huge difference uh, from previous stages when we were fulfilling uh, the uh, association agreement and we were starting only our partners uh, with uh, international donors. And I believe that the European Parliament played a great role and I would like to thank uh, to the uh, speaker of the Parliament and to the vice speakers and to the MPs that European integration is the becoming the idea, uh, the, even the ideology which unites the MPs, and it uh, allows to adopt a very necessary laws and uh, almost uh, all plenary weeks are organized in the way that uh, some uh, um, decisions are taken concerning uh, the necessary steps to implement uh, the association agreement. And it's in fact great because the parliament is the structure which uh, used uh, to be to request uh, a lot from the government but uh, was not capable to show the result by voting and uh, this uh, year we have also a, a very good involvement of the president who supports the reforms uh, on uh, your integration and your atlantic integration but i think uh, that everything is possible that all the documents all the policies which are being formed are being formed on our your integration commitments and every week at the sitting of the government we are taking the decisions uh, which are aimed at implementation of the um, association agreement so we have this euro integration vision in fact and i'm really happy that today we will have um, a great time together discussing what are our further big plans for us uh, my for myself the priority is the renewing of the association agreement you know uh, that uh, that's the topic which is very acute because ukraine showed its capability to implement uh, the requirements of the association, the free zone, and also Ukraine show that it can boost its potential and it can uh, also show uh, bigger results. And also the policy uh, which is uh, in, it has a new uh, policy on the uh, green policy, which opens uh, for Ukraine to become a member of the new paradigm, paradigm, new reality, new type of relations within the EU, and also the relations with of the EU with the uh, third partners. And I am very proud uh, that no one uh, questions uh, the uh, idea of uh, collaborating with Ukraine uh, in this green sector. And I'm very happy that Ukraine is protecting its interests uh, are also, is also protecting the interests uh, of other countries. That's uh, the outcome uh, of uh, our great efforts. So there are no doubts that 
we are sustainably moving to uh, our euro integration aspirations and i'm very happy that uh, today the uh, collaboration of the parliament of the president and of the government uh, is active and we can think in a strategic way and in the most ambitious one thank you olga now uh, we will have uh, the speech uh, of uh, ivana klimbush tsensadze uh, she can have a controversial idea and i will ask a very direct question as we know all uh, the uh, previous years uh, ukraine was lagging behind from the implementation uh, plan of the association agreement so do uh, can we say uh, on uh, the ground of what you have mentioned uh, that uh, the association agreement will be fulfilled 100%? Of course, we cannot fulfill 100% uh, uh, because uh, we uh, will uh, draft uh, the renewal association agreement. I think that uh, um, Mr. Kachka will answer uh, you in detail and a lot. Uh, but uh, I'm uh, always following the pulse of the agreement and I uh, look at the dynamic, I track the dynamics every month. So uh, we are almost 80%. Uh, so we are, I could say that uh, all the year we were like uh, trying to catch up um uh, by the votings uh by the taxation uh, by uh, the customs the legislation so uh, while uh, tracking the dynamics so when we are aiming to have a uh, 100 percent this year we uh, still had uh, to catch up the, the, those aspects which were lagging behind from 2016. now it's much easier to speak about the implementation of the session when um everything is uh, on trail and we have the agenda till the end of the year and we know uh, that the uh, parliament will be voting for the decisions uh, uh, this and that till the end of the year and the government uh, will um, uh, provide uh, the necessary documents so if speaking about the statistics and dynamics uh, it's uh, in fact uh, uh, a shocking one but in a positive way so if we compare uh, uh, with uh, the grade existing in the schools of Ukraine from 12, 12 uh, grades, uh, how would you grade uh, our performance this year? Let's uh, have a, a poll uh, with uh, the speakers. Uh, it's complicated to grade. Uh, um, I'm a person uh, which is always asking for more uh, because I always see the place for improvement. But I would say that uh, from the political assessment, it would be it would be eight because there is always where to move forward. It's great. Now we will have uh, the uh, speech of uh, Ivana klimpush -Tentadze. Maybe she will have a completely different or a controversial uh, idea. Let's listen. Dear friends, dear colleagues, dear partners, I'm very thankful for the invitation to participate uh, in uh, this uh, dialogue about the reforms. And I will start uh, in a very different way. And I will uh, say that the government uh, is, in fact, uh, very in a bad uh, way represented for the uh, society. We uh, had uh, done not enough reforms and we should have acted uh, in a even a more uh, different in, in a more concise way so uh, for uh, the followers couldn't have the possibility uh, to uh, color uh, uh, the reforms uh, in 
different colors in green or in an African. Kaka Bendukitsa was uh, saying uh, that the reforms should be uh, crucial and uh, unreversible. And uh, he also said that uh, those who, who are performing the reform, uh, that uh, they shouldn't, she could not be reversed. Uh, and that those who are performing reforms will be hated uh, by the society. You should have controlled the government and parliament and uh, even uh, to influence the judicial system you have just managed to ruin the reforms which were introduced early that's what we should know uh, about uh, the newly uh, performed uh, the newly elected um, uh, officials another important step is we should remember that we lost, uh, we uh, lived the transition period uh, uh, to our followers, uh, but unfortunately those who came after us didn't use the situation uh, and uh, they didn't have the sustainability. Uh, and the president uh, doesn't have the possibility uh, to draft the strategy he is uh, moving from one side to another one but reforms uh, is not only about adoption uh, the laws and decisions the implementation is even a more important step i'm quite proud to say that the renewal of the uh, energy uh, addendum 27 uh, but we should speak about the implementation the government hasn't introduced uh, the uh, procedure uh, of aligning of the laws and bylaws with the EU. It doesn't uh, allow to receive the awaited uh, outcome, but could also influence the other areas because uh, the EU uh, can see uh, that we're institutionally incapable uh, to uh, perform uh, the commitments which we have undertaken. Not the less important factor is communication with the uh, civil society and communication with the NGOs. And it's uh, not about the uh, video clips uh, where everyone uh, is responsible, but not the president. But we should explain uh, to common people uh, what they will receive after the reforms are being implemented. We should change the narratives and also um, how they will perceive it. And uh, I'm also guilty that we haven't communicated in the right way uh, with the civil society. Uh, if uh, we had uh, communicated in a better way, then we uh, wouldn't lost. Uh, and reforms is not about the magic band. Uh, it's not uh, from changing the pumpkin uh, into a carriage, but it's a very uh, long and uh, very complicated work. And uh, Karl Jasper, the German philosopher, was uh, writing that uh, the past is a present which have already happened. So uh, our present uh, is uh, not uh, about the reforms, but that we are losing uh, the uh, reforms, what we have achieved, and the elimination uh, of uh, the judicial system uh, reform uh, just uh, brought uh, that the rules uh, can be uh, violated. And what I have mentioned already, I would like to say that uh, finally we should have uh, taken uh, the uh, lessons learned uh, and uh, the next half and year should uh, be passed uh, in the way of collaboration of the opposition, of the, the government, and we jointly should uh, draft uh, the uh, roadmap how to implement this plan. Thank you, and have a fruitful work. So we couldn't actually ask a question about the assessment of the today's Euro integration so, Olga, no, what do you think about that? Thank you, Yuri. Let me share some of the comments of mine regarding two main major mm -hmm. questions. Yes, of course, indeed, we should have been faster and more decisive. But for us not to actually waste time for catching up with the reforms that 
hadn't been implemented by the previous political cycle. And in order to keep up with the pace without losing time, I am trying to push some of the reforms forward towards European integration and Euro Atlantic integration that I myself actually contributed to in 2019. So I can reassure you once again that I've, I'm fully in line with the commitments that the team of European integrators had been suggesting last year to the new government. But I want to underline once again that possibly today we heard a bit of bitter messages from Ivana's statement. We can now see how when you focus on the reforms and uh, you should implement something really tangible and it's sometimes really difficult. So let us actually talk about the outcomes that we've had so far. And even coming back to my presentation, we could really realize that we can, maybe it doesn't look as bright in our communication, not everything is that unanimous. However, we understand that in the next political cycle, the politicians um, that will come after ourselves will be in a much better situation than we are. There was a statement that there is threat to European integration and it is challenged. What do you think about that? Being a legal professional, I can only suggest some facts. Have we had this, have we had this threat? I think neither the president nor the government nor Security and Defense Council would actually resp respond altogether very decisively against the rulings of the Constitutional Court. I think this is just the beginning of the systemic revenge plan to actually lift all the reform agendas from the standpoint of the entire leadership in the country. So even if we put it that way, I'm sure we have to keep doing this. Whoever can say, okay, we have so many leading challenging, uh, uh, some tangible challenge. And we need to be thinking critically. And there are some facts that really emphasize that we are growing the speed and not reducing the speed. When are you going to put an end to the threat that we have experienced so far? Let's start with the fact that there is no threat like this whatsoever. Look, we are a democratic state, so we cannot actually restrict other people from expressing their own point of view. But at the same time, there is critical mass of the people who have the right understanding. And I mean here, our political leadership and government leadership, they're trying to push forward all the intended solutions and even the fact that we have the Vice Prime Minister on European and Euro-Atlantic integration is another manifestation of the irreversibility of our course. Naturally, we need to fight against certain deviations and have them properly fixed, but I'm sure it's not that influential. I mean, this critical point is not that influential as it might seem to be. So. What's the opinion of the president's office here? Of course, Ms. Klimperson Sotsi's statement provoked a lot of comments and possibly answers. But I will refrain from sharing my comments directly here. But I'm going to try, however, to share my vision of the challenges, challenges raised by challenging issues raised by the colleagues here at the panel, as well as some of the insights shared by Ms. Klimpush Sensadze. Uh, when we talk about the glass, whether it is half full or half empty, I have to 
remind you here that many people uh, that are trying to build something, they sometimes even say there is no glass at all. This is also a proven fact. This highly dignified audience in the today's forum can see those manipulations and highly politicized messages. So we're trying to use a different narrative here. But, and with this, I'd like to come back to my own assessment of the Euro European integration's place in the policy that is run by the president of Ukraine. I want to thank the organizers for this conference because the rehabilitation reforms package has always been well known for its energy and courage and results-based approach. And even despite the pandemic, we have still a lot of work that is being done. We are working online. Of course, it is challenging to do that with all the restrictions that are imposed. But I'd like to thank our colleagues from the Embassy of Lithuania for their restless support. And also want to welcome all the online participants of the meeting today. And we'll answer some of the questions that you might have. I just wanted to remind you that the today's discussion regarding the European integration is taking place in the reforms conference agenda. And I want to remind you that back in 2017, when we first organized such a conference on the Ukraine's reforms in London, initially, the then mm, Foreign Minister Boris Johnson in the United Kingdom, it was his initiative to establish such a platform so that the Ukrainian government and Ukrainian leaders could actually demonstrate their accomplishments on the way to reforms. And on the other hand, the international, Ukraine's international partners could have an opportunity to discuss everything openly with the Ukrainian peers about what is crucially important on this reform pace, what could, could be done faster or different. And actually, this created an opportunity to discuss strategy, operations, and tactics in the reforms implementation. I still remember when we were discussing very practicable issues on the reforms, this is corporate governance and uh, European integration issues. We were discussing the healthcare reform and many other items. We had very, very successful exercise at that time. The then Prime Minister Groisman, had, when when had meetings with his peers, had said the progress was, or might seem to be insignificant, but even mm, the fact that we started applying English law in privatization process was a good manifestation that we were moving and are moving in the right direction. Regarding the events that are going to take place next year in Lithuania, I want to thank the Lithuanian government and the president of Lithuania for this encouragement to be to host the next year's meeting. I'm sure, it's, unfortunately, this year, when both presidents were ready to go to Lithuania and open the conference on the 7th of July, given the restrictions and uh, lockdown, we had to postpone the event. But I have no doubt whatsoever that this event is going to take place anyways. And the Ukrainian government will have a bit more time to even uh, foster some of the most ambitious goals and collect some more information to be shared with the international partners on that platform. Tell about the plans. And most importantly, we're going to have an opportunity to better communicate to our partners. Both formally and informally, the nerve and the momentum of the reforms that are pushed forward by the government. Now, as for how European integration and Ukrainian foreign policy is placed, I am absolutely supportive of what Olga just said. And trying to make an, in, in our assessments, we need to refer to facts only and consider what's going on in real terms, what has been declared, and we need to make an assessment not by actually 
using political narratives or expert narratives, but actually refer to facts, to bare facts alone. Undoubtedly, the Ukrainian, European and Euro integra integration course remains to be unchanged. If we take into account some of the uh, criticism coming from some of the political parties that there is a reverse back, it means that somebody is really willing to do that. Secondly, there was the Ukraine EU summit. Of course, many supporters had said the summit would be a real failure. Those are not the supporters, but doomsayers, I would, I would say. We have facts instead. The joint declaration as a result of this summit has been the most ambitious throughout all the times since we remember such events taking place. I have to emphasize that the Ukraine's president is always trying to raise the ambition and degree of encouragement uh, for our European aspirations. The association agreement review is another milestone for the Ukraine's reform agenda. We are saying, okay, we want to update the association agreement, not only its trade part, but also sectoral parts of it. So we're trying to take advantage of all the available tools in the association agreement to make sure we're more productive, move the reforms faster. Of course, one could criticize ourselves and say that the implementation pace is kind of slow and could be, could be done better. But anyways, here's the message that I want to share. Whenever we were trying to evaluate the speed and performance of the association agreement, to be quite honest, uh, the vice prime minister on the European integration, it's not that the vice prime minister, nor the president, nor the cabinet given, give their assessment that all the citizens of Ukraine have to share. We're not trying to convince anyone, but we are trying to be working together for the sake of this ambitious goal. The president and the cabinet and all the subject matter ministers and ministries have clearly adjusted themselves to perform the association agreement. We actually have a lot of support for European integration of Ukraine and we're gonna be conducting every international event with our partners in order to communicate this, this ambition of ours, communicate our goodwill, but at the same time, we're gonna be honest about how we would really want to change some of the items of the and provisions of the association agreement. Coming back to the reforms conference, I should say it's probably not a secret that in 2022, as in 2022, the conference will be hosted by Switzerland. Uh, the president already signed the uh, arrangements with the Swiss side about this. And I'm deeply convinced that in 2022, we're gonna be able to at least raise the expectations for the Ukraine's European integration pace. And I'm sure we're gonna be, be able to demonstrate many more accomplishments. And obviously we're gonna demonstrate the real tangible progress to our European partners. This is it from my side. And uh, coming back to Yuri's question regarding my own assessment, I would probably use the score points between zero and five. I would now mark it as a four. And, um, you know, it's not that bad. I have to say, we will probably have to say goodbye for now with Olga because she's been with us for two panel discussions. And we want to thank you very much, Olga, for your engagement. Uh, your participation was really important for us. Oh, you decided that I have to leave 
Okay, let me then leave you for the discussion, but I'll still keep track of your discussion online. Everybody have a very good conversation and discussions. Andre, what do you think we have to do for this constitutional um, crisis to have no effect on our cores? Well, today there is clear understanding among all the experts, I mean, legal professionals and specifically constitutional law professionals, politicians, government, European partners, as well as international organizations, I mean, those who keep track of the constitutional crisis of Ukraine, that there is no just a clear legal mechanism that could be a solution. Of course, it is there, but it will probably take a lot of time. And if when, when utilized, this can actually be um, very damaging for the Ukrainian economy and for Ukraine's legal framework. Ukraine's president clearly shared a message that in this particular situation, there should be a political and legal decision, I mean, solution, I'm sorry, through diplomatic channels, when talking to our international partners, we keep underlining. Indeed, there is a political and legal solution to the crisis. The president is absolutely dedicated to the idea and will be doing everything possible to actually restart all those anti-corruption bodies as soon as possible and to clearly kickstart again the judicial reform. We had a conversation with the Venus Commission leadership and the president uh, asked the, the Venus Commission to give their legal advice on the possible solutions here to the crisis. And the president uh, clearly instructed all the respective authorities and agencies to follow this track. Thank you. But today, now it's worth giving the floor to the representatives of the European Union. Mati Masikas, what do you think Mati, do you think the glass is half full or half empty? Thank you. I'm really happy that the, the reform conference has become a, a very, very important event in the in the annual uh, very tight schedule of of, of the EU Ukraine relations. I mean, the summit in October that was referred to um, was a success. It was it was rightly pointed out. The association committee met last Friday, and um, in December, the meeting of the association council will take place. And by by that time, the EU will publish its uh, an association annual association implementation report, uh, report um, which outlines the uh, Ukraine's progress in implementing commitments under the under the association agreement. Um, uh, Ukraine uh, published its report already uh, already in in springtime. Um, while we are doing our assessment, we are not only relying on our own experts, but also um, what also learn from our engagement with the with the civil society, and this is extremely important. And I will come back to this: um, the role of civil society representing the citizens um, of Ukraine is extremely important part of this um, of this full. Uh, the whole whole cooperation. Um, uh, the Ukrainian government uh, recently has prioritized legislative reforms um, relating to the association agreement uh, commitments. Uh, a couple of uh, weeks ago, I was uh, I had the honor uh, to be present at the uh, the launch of the of the coordination commission. Uh, bringing together the um, uh, the government, the parliament, also the, the presidential office, uh, chaired by the prime minister. It's it's very important that the commitment comes from the highest level. Of course, this year, um, I mean, normally at this point, I would have had 
I would have had the full list of um, of the EU or the association agreement related uh, legislation ready. Um, that that needs to be or would be at verge of being uh, of being adopted mm, with the with the situation with COVID and uh, its impact on the Parliament's work. Of course, uh, uh, this this list is shorter than than normally, and, and while regret, regretting that, that of course, and that of course uh, is. Um, is partly at least understandable. Um, next year, it has been pointed out by previous speakers, um, next year we together engage uh, on a re review process of the, of the association agreement that we have. It's, it's five year, uh, uh, it's been, it will have been in force five years, so um, it's uh, it's uh, a review uh, of the achievements of it um, is foreseen, uh, and then uh, I mean there you have um, there you have a fundamental question or a fundamental choice whether the association agreement, which is which is the broadest and and most uh, and more comprehensive agreement that Ukraine has with any, well, sorry, well, what the EU has with any partner country. Whether this asso association agreement is a blueprint for reforms in Ukraine, or is it uh, just a, um, a basis to tick some boxes to do something because it's international obligation, because our international partners sort of demand that or something. That's a that's a big question. That's a funda fundamental choice. I mean, uh, the association agreement, uh, as it was conceived and negotiated, um, was an offer for a blueprint for EU relate European, if you will, European reforms. And, and the, the EU and the EU delegation here in Kiev is in, in full disposal uh, to our Ukrainian partners to make the best use of this agreement as, as, a, as a blueprint, as a roadmap of reforms. I, I raise that in particular, you know, having civil society uh, representatives present uh, and uh, so, I mean, uh, at the end of this week, will mark the uh, the seventh anniversary of the Revolution of Dignity. Um, I mean, with these heroic events, I mean, or these heroic events cemented Ukraine's Euro-Atlantic choice, Euro-Atlantic. Um, Orientation that is that is uh, now one of your constitutional values. So um, let's make let's make use of this agreement as uh, as the as the as, as something more than just a a um, collection of boxes that one needs uh, one feels the need to the need to tick. Um, of course, the EU's support for Ukraine's uh, sovereignty, uh, territorial integrity, and independence is unwavering. Uh, that goes that goes without saying. And again, uh, we are of um, firm belief that with the implementation of the of the EU-related reforms, Ukraine becomes more resilient. And that would, be, uh, on its part, help to help to underpin, help to help to strengthen Ukraine's sovereignty, sovereignty as well. With with uh, the um, reform offer comes also our financial offer. Previous speakers have uh, uh, laid out the 15 billion euro that the EU has mobilized in loans and grants since since 20, 2014, plus in the COVID context, 
for Ukraine to fight COVID, so the EU has mobilized 190 million euro plus 1.2 billion as macro financial macro financial uh, assistance. It all, I mean, uh, it all again helps strengthen Ukraine's resilience in the COVID context. Of course, I. Uh, I wish I wish uh, well, and I wish a speedy and full recovery to President Zelensky, Speaker uh, Razumkov, and and uh, other members of the of the um, uh, Ukrainian government who who are currently currently diagnosed with uh, with coronavirus. Um, the virus, unfortunately, prevents us to make use of the. Um, or make full use of the visa-free travel. Yeah. That's um, that's a huge achievement. Granting visa-free travel three years ago was was the EU delivering on our commitments to Ukraine. The EU had committed, and we. We, we acted upon our commitments. It was a two-way street. There were Ukrainian commitments. There are. This is, this is, this is all clear. Uh, now, some of these commitments have been challenged by the, by the Constitutional Court of, uh, of Ukraine. And it's up to the elected leaders uh, of Ukraine and up to the parliament to face these challenges posed by the Constitutional Court to, to restore uh, the, the um, asset declarations, to restore the um, to restore uh, the uh, legal certainty around uh, Nabu and others, so that Ukrainian commitments uh, in this context would be would be honoured, would be would be continuously honoured as well. Um, and there's nothing sexy in there. Uh, Olga was speaking uh, before me about sexy reforms. No, it's a very tough, very tough work. And it has been pointed out there are no good solutions in this, but it but it certainly needs to be done, and it takes all the dedication of uh, of the political leadership. Three weeks have passed since the constitutional court's decision. Uh, so much has been achieved during the the past past seven seven years. I mean, Ukraine's economy has been stabilized. The banking sector has been has been cleaned up. Trade uh, ha, uh, has increased uh, with the EU uh, enormously. Energy sector uh, has been, or much of the energy sector has been reformed, and so on and so on. Decentralization. Uh, we are very much looking forward to working with our Ukrainian partners within the framework of the association agreement to to. Uh, Overcome, overcome the crisis, and to uh, and to anchor these achievements even tighter to our cooperation framework. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your detailed statement. But can you score between zero and twelve? What is your assessment of the Euro Ukraine's European integration work this year? Very much a matter of uh, of diplomats' uh, professionalism, uh, not to fall into the trap into the trap of uh, of, um, uh, of 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 putting grades. No, but I'm an actual practitioner in diplomacy and in in EU Ukraine relations, and it's quite often so that uh, for uh, for think tankers and academics, the glass uh, seems uh, uh, half empty. 
for actual practitioners, people who, who need to need to work every day on the practical aspects of these things. The glass, the glass is um, mostly half full. And in the in the EU Ukraine relations, the, the glass is even more than half full. Thank you. So we never heard the figures, but now we're going to have a lot of figures instead, because we're going to be listening to Taras Kachka. Taras Kachka is involved in the practical implementation of the Ukraine's European integration. And um, Taras, what do we, what can we expect from all this? I think we have to expect very intensive work between Ukraine and the European Union. Like His Excellency just said, we have grown our trade volumes immensely. And this year we came across the biggest drop down in the trade turnover. And um, mostly the uh, Ukraine's exports contribute to the Asian markets most of all. But the European Union was one of the um, most hit markets by the pandemic. But when it comes back to normal, I think we're going to go move back to our, the volumes of trade as we had before. But trade can should be actually confirmed not only by the volumes, but also by the mutual claims against each other. So when we're talking about our relations, then at least I am confident that we have the clear list of expectations when speaking in diplomatic diplomatic terms i wouldn't call them claims but expectations that is the right word we're trying to catch up with the things that we should have had done should have done much earlier than that because moving from promises to practical work is a challenging and a very important job nonetheless it was the president's and the prime minister's commitments, was the previous ones and these ones, the current ones. We started doing the job with a joint effort together. And we started the, our mission, which lasts for another several months. Some time was lost, but anyways, whatever we're trying to do right now is to try to catch up, like take the decision on the seeds. We should have passed this decision years ago but now we endorsed it and it, this required a lot of political will and a lot of work to be done. But today it is Ukraine that drives European integration and not the European Union that much because we continuously talk about active agendas and we are always aspiring for something whenever we see that we can have something tangible achieved. We can of course, we are of course doing that. So updating the association agreement is not just an attempt to add to the wish list, but it's an attempt to make it even more intensive because at large, we still keep the memories of the things uh, and lessons learned in the past, but we're trying to actually do things today which are expected and have been expected for, for about a decade now and some of those ideas are being implemented only now. We have to be also mindful that in the association agreement update will bring more understanding of the joint commitments together. Ukraine has done a great job doing the homework in most of the sectors. There are things that have to do with trade, but there are a lot of things about environment. It, it was quite challenging for us to perform the environmental uh, annex, but we still did it. We've done it. We endorsed and approved legislation. We have the right institutions in place. And now uh, this is a question how we get integrated into the climate change and environmental protection agendas and how our companies will be contributing to this huge objective. It is about the great transformation taking place in Ukraine's agriculture. Hopefully in the nearest, in, in the closest parliament session, 
we're going to pass the law on animal welfare and uh, food safety legislation. So we have to be speaking like partners together and discuss what we should do in the next decade. And on this basis, we're going to be pushing forward the initiatives about the Green Deal because this is a really, really outstanding thing and a really good one because it's probably one of the first attempts, if not the only one, when we can affirmatively say that the European Union has been promising uh, to integrate Ukraine even more economically to the, to the EU internal market, then now we are really building the foundation through our policies to make sure our economy is as green as possible. It is intended till 2050, but let's do it together. Let us discuss what kind of contribution that Ukraine can make in this endeavor, how we can help the EU and how EU can help us back. Hopefully, um, the EU's opinion will be in line with our ambition. The association agreement had not just been an offer from the European Union, or nor it was the checklist. It's uh, the result of very comprehensive, long-lasting, and very difficult negotiations. So let us keep in mind Ukraine had been even more ambitious sometimes than the EU regarding uh, the association agreement. So at large today, I was even really surprised because when we were discussing the agreement and we had been incorporating the European integration goals, I thought it would never be possible. But already today, I could definitely confirm that in every um, single line of the association agreement, we've reached considerable progress, not only in planning, but also in um, the legislation that was actually nurtured and things are becoming even more difficult because European integration is uh, like the pool, which has to be filled with something tangible. Of course, you may have, one can have different opinions in the society, which sometimes leads to situations like we have right now with the Constitutional Court and the anti-corruption anti legislation. And it's not the first, nor, nor it is the last attack on the Constitutional Court uh, or the anti-constitutional frameworks. Sorry, anti-corruption frameworks, to apologize. But anyways, we've had the experience of solving problems like this, so we have no doubt whatsoever that anti-corruption policy will be an, uh, the integral part of our daily routine life and uh, things will work in the future. Same thing as with the courts. So many debates there had been started uh, back in 2014 and then we started doing the job and the today's judiciary works in the new constitutional environment these days because the constitution was amended specifically for this purpose. And the constitutional court itself now enjoys a different different constitutional framework. So the framework was developed with the help of the experts, including those from the European Union, including those that are funded by the European Union. So anything that's going on in Ukraine is our joint responsibility. And this is quite a natural evolution of things. So we actually have a situation when we need to realize there is no, sorry, European integration uh, is no longer Ukraine's homework. We're not students, but we are partners and we have to be conscious of this. Why should we be evaluated this way by our partners? It's not even a good question. It's, it's not the teacher to student relationship. It's not yet a question of Ukraine's accession to the European Union. And it's not what the European Union proposed. If we have, if we are partners, we have our mutual commitments and responsibilities. Speaking about trade, we have fantastic progress. Over 40% of the trade turnover we have with the EU. We're growing our exports to the EU. And I've already mentioned some figures about this year. We have 14,000 companies already exporting to the European Union from all over Ukraine. Those are all truisms and without 
need to be proving that every time, but this means that Ukraine is taking considerable considerable steps forward in their integrate in its integration with the European Union. So today Ukraine is the key partner in in B2B production supplies. Speaking about agriculture, Ukraine's agriculture and farming have become very reliable suppliers into the European market. Because people keep joking that we keep drilling Spanish corn, but anyways, then what should we do? Never sit down and talk about anything else? I'm sure these things create even greater competition. Partnership requires to be quite clear with all the stakeholders that th this partnership is of vital importance and even more because Ukraine is a really dedicated and consistent partner for uh, by implementing European policies virtually in all spheres of life. Very often it's not communicated properly. Look, in terms of environment, we are following the European Aki because we take the, we borrow the European models. We have no policy virtually where we would never um, actually align ourselves with the EU Aki. Starting from the last fall, what we've been implementing has been record breaking because the number of leftovers that had been promised for such a long time were finally completed. We had all the endorsements and now we're tra transitioning to even a greater and more difficult model. This has to do with enforcing the legislation and it's much more challenging than building plans. So we would encourage even more and greater support from the European Union. This is my hope that the dialogue that we've been maintaining last week in the uh, association committees meeting and uh, the week before in the trade committee meeting, the spirit of partnership and joint ambition will be employed to the greatest extent possible. And nobody has any doubts about this. I mean, uh, both parties. Thank you. Thank you, Taras. The question which I usually ask about uh, the grade uh, and one of the biggest uh, challenges is the arbitration on a uh, forest. Uh, would you tell uh, whether it is a issue with the EU? Of course, the arbitration is now uh, at the stage of uh, the drafting the uh, ruling. So uh, as soon as we have it, we will communicate it. But uh, of course, we should also understand uh, that there are also issues about the effective collaboration of Ukraine with the EU in all uh, EU in all those areas, as for example the forest. As for the grading, I wouldn't grade myself, but I would grade the EU. So the EU is uh, uh, assessing at uh, f four, but from five, five grade, uh, uh, from 12 uh, grading scale, it would be too conservative. So four from five from the old system. And now we're passing the floor to Veronica. What's your assessment? How effective and dynamic was your integration? Could we have achieved more? Thanks a lot on one part it's so good to participate and also to uh, present uh, in uh, the team of those uh, very nice uh, speakers i was not willing to negotiate and to discuss uh, or uh, to have a dispute with them but about the economic assessment, Ukraine has received what was awaited first. So the turnover of goods increased and partially it was achieved because we had some crisis. That's why the internal demand was lower than the international demand. That's why the export growed and it's not only the nominal growth 
I think in 2018, we first uh, mentioned uh, that the export uh, Ukraine, from Ukraine uh, achieved the biggest maximum from the independence. In 2020, we have the new, uh, in 19, we had the second uh, maximum. But uh, it's not all the nominal uh, growth. Uh, uh, and uh, it means not only that uh, the importance of the EU is growing, uh, but also we should uh, say that uh, the importance of uh, Russia is uh, decreasing. Uh, also, we are discussing uh, the uh, topic uh, of uh, the produced goods, not on the, on the raw materials. When we listen to the TV, uh, People do not know, but uh, the number of the produced uh, goods uh, is increasing, and the assortment uh, of uh, the goods uh, increases as well. At, uh, when I calculated last time, the uh, last year, we are exporting around 75-80% of um, uh, what we are exporting. Uh, all around the world are exported to the EU. Of course, some goods are being exported uh, faster and, and bigger volumes. Uh, so different goods uh, are being exported to the EU. And that's what is uh, different uh, of, from Ukraine uh, than uh, with China. And uh, China is saving us, in, in fact. Uh, because uh, they uh, are concentrated on uh, very few uh, goods. So there is expert. Uh, there are some reasons why, uh, which in fact simulated. Uh, also uh, the elimination of some uh, custom uh, fees and so, but also the technical regulation um, was adopted uh, and in the customs. Uh, our researches uh, show uh, that this also influenced uh, the uh, turnover. Now we have the project, uh, so the transparent customs. So the important is uh, that there is a poll and we were asking uh, the assessment uh, of uh, reforms in uh, customs and uh, the assessment is uh, much higher than we used to, to receive. Uh, all uh, this are positive uh, signs which uh, are the building blocks for the future. We were uh, um, received what we uh, awaited for. On the other hand, we have an issue that we haven't received the second part which we were awaiting for. Uh, so uh, the investments were not coming in a fast way. So the internal investment grows. Uh, we received the deregulation, better business climate, but we didn't receive a huge uh, inflow uh, of investments which uh, um, is the the background for sustainable uh, development and uh, a few times uh, this topic uh, was mentioned during our panel discussion and one of this is the judicial reform and uh, also the rule of law and also the constitutional reform. We have achieved a lot, a lot in those areas, but now we are uh, uh, almost uh, in the abyss, uh, just uh, uh, trying to climb from this uh, abyss. But uh, uh, this judicial uh, reform, which we started, we didn't uh, succeed to, to uh, make it a sustain, uh, sufficient one. I think that as uh, uh, this topic was started at the first panel, uh, we will continue this discussion during uh, the whole week because that's the uh, basics, that the background. Because the economic regulations in Ukraine maybe are not perfect, but they are not the worst in the world. Of course, there, are, there is always place for improvement and the community and society uh, is growing and developing and the digital is being developed. And then uh, this uh, green sector, we will change the regulation. Uh, 
because the life is going on, but there is some uh, background, uh, some basic notions, and that's the rule of law. I'm an economist, but I understand that without this, even my assessment of the grade or of the uh, implementation of the uh, EU association agreement will not be a, a stable assessment. We have received what we wanted from expert, but we haven't received what we are will, were willing in uh, the justice sector. And why? Because we have a hole uh, in uh, the uh, basic Thanks, uh, Veronica. And finally, we have a possibility to talk about the future, how we can improve our achievements in your integration. I like your idea. Thank you, Yuri. Because uh, it's, uh, it's much easier. And between Russian and English, I choose English. Uh, I would like to underline a few things indeed uh, regarding the probability of uh, better implementation of reforms related to the European integration in Ukraine. And I think that uh, one of the one of the issues which are which is currently on the agenda and each, which is uh, being observed, I, I'm, I'm not an official. I can I can speak freely about this. Is that uh, EU? On the one hand, EU is running out of uh, tools uh, to push for uh, much needed reforms in Ukraine. I mean, EU has indeed. Uh, uh, technical assistance, financial assistance for Ukraine, but uh, this uh, seems to be insufficient. And we had previous cases uh, previ in previous year, years, uh, cases like uh, visa liberalization for Ukraine, which was not about financial assistance, but was a very powerful incentive for Ukraine to implement very painful reforms uh, at that time. And the second, and on the other hand, the second problem is that Ukraine is also running out of arguments why it cannot cope with uh, having, I mean, uh, a majority in the parliament, a pro-European majority in the parliament, having a president which decla who declared uh, European integration as a, as a priority, why is not able to cope with this resistance in a lot of institutions to uh, 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 finalize the judiciary, the reform in the judiciary, as just Veronica mentioned, and to uh, uh, ensure a lasting, uh, a, a sustainable uh, work of the anti-corruption institutions. So this is, this is a sort of uh, mismatch expectations from the both sides, EU and Ukraine currently. And I think that uh, one of the uh, problems which we see in the future and which might also generate some difficulties in implementing reforms is that uh, we are missing uh, a target uh, in the relations between Ukraine and the EU. And when I'm saying this is that uh, we have association agreement, which is indeed a good uh, instrument to mobilize for reforms, uh, but we already... Uh, we already moved, I mean, the association agreement is on, on the pinnacle already, and uh, it's no longer capable to, uh, in, in my opinion, is not longer capable to uh, mobilize unprecedented uh, support for reforms. And we need, because we need something in between, uh, membership is not available for, in the European Union, I, association agreement is no longer a very powerful tool and we need something in between we need a mega incentive which has to be in between association agreement and membership in order that uh, ukraine would be able to do uh, more of what it's uh, it, it is on the agenda and i think here we also have a problem with certain member states uh, we saw at the last summit that there were uh, states which uh, had a more cautious uh, approach on the statement. In the end, I'm happy that the statement was very positive, but uh, uh, we realized that there are states which don't, do not necessarily want Ukraine to get more economically integrated in the EU single market. There are states which do not want EU to develop uh, 
uh, co cooperation in the security uh, dimension. So uh, this has to be worked out in order to uh, make sure that uh, uh, we have an ambitious uh, agenda in the future. Uh, maybe one more uh, element which which i would like to to underline is that uh, mm, there is a certain impression uh in in ukrainian i i spoke to ukrainian mps sometimes to ukrainian experts uh, that uh, eu is less and less ready to deepen relations with ukraine regardless of how uh, of how the country perf performs uh, performs in reforms, in implementing reforms, and this is a very dangerous trend from my perspective, uh, because uh, uh, this might uh, turn out into into uh, 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 an anti-Western and anti-EU uh, basically narrative in Ukraine at the level of certain certain uh, players. I mean. We have now a comfortable, a rather comfortable, a rather pro-EU uh, stance uh, from the, the key political players in Ukraine. But we also hear sometimes in the parliament, even from the ruling party, that uh, uh, we shouldn't do everything uh, as uh, everything for granted. I mean, we have to rethink uh, certain issues. Uh, we hear about the fact that association agreement is not so good for us in all the sectors as it as we have considered this initially and so on and so on so there is a certain skepticism which i think uh, is normal for a democratic society and uh, uh, but but also we need to make sure that we do not uh, allow to weaken the support the political support for the uh, uh, EU integration for the reforms which are taking place. Uh, and one last uh, remark about uh, what Ambassador, uh, EU Ambassador mentioned uh, about civil society. I think engagement with civil society is indeed very important, but I would really recommend uh, that EU is engaging more broadly with civil society because, for instance, uh, at the last uh, visit, uh, when uh, Mr. Borrell visited Ukraine, he met with representatives of civil society of one organization uh, dealing with anti-corruption, which I think is uh, very good and shows clear priority from the EU side. But I think that Ukraine has more uh, areas where which are problematic and uh, an engagement from the EU side with uh, wider how to, how to say, subjects uh, uh, in, in the Ukrainian civil society would be, would be uh, recommended. Um, I will stop here. Uh, the last question. I would I would say uh, not I would not grade the relations, but I would say that um, I would say which trend we have, and I think we have a positive trend. Yeah, we have a positive trend with some serious barriers, like the one which happened recently. I mean, the constitutional the the situation with the constitutional court, but I would say that the trend is positive, and 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 I hope it stays like this. Thank you, and I think that we can wrap up our discussion. So we can see that so we have obstacles, but most of our speakers are optimistic. Thank you.
Ja dabar užsimutinu gal, ne? Aš nesiu ir girdžiuosi turbūt.
мене чути? Доброго дня, шановні колеги. Радий вас вітати на нашій панелі по євроатлантичній інтеграції та національній безпеці. Терасин Чина, from the um, Reform Support Office that is funded by the Government of Canada. And it is my honor today to introduce our today's panelists. This is Christina Queen, Charge d'Affaires of the United States to Ukraine. Also, Larissa Halatza. Ambassador of Canada to Ukraine, also Mr. Voldemar Sarapinas, Ambassador of Lithuania to Ukraine. We have here with us Alexander Bunyak, Acting Director of the International Cooperation Department of the Ukraine's Ministry of Defense. We also have here Mr. Alexander Vinikov from the NATO liaison office in Ukraine. We're going to be joined by Alexei Hitchuk, Acting Director General of the Government Office for European and Euro-Atlantic Integration. We also have Mr. Mihailo Samos with us, Deputy Director for International Affairs from the Studies of the Armed Forces Conversion and Disarmament. And also we have Elena Trehub with us. Secretary General of the Independent Anti-Corruption Committee on Defense. And we hope that we're going to be joined by Mariana Bezula, member of the Ukrainian Parliament, Deputy Chair of the Parliamentary Committee on National Security, Defense, and Intelligence. So we're going to have one hour and 30 minutes for our discussion. Given the number of participants we have, we're going to be uh, allocating seven to eight minutes for each of the in interventions. And let me ask the first question to Larissa Haladza, Your Excellency. Would be better for you? I will answer in English. You can ask. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. So, uh, uh, Mr. Galadza, uh, Canadian government is very actively support your Atlantic integration uh, of Ukraine. Uh, I know because I'm a part of one of the projects founded by, by Canadian government. Uh, recently, uh, new projects aimed on reform of defense sector were announced. Uh, particularly, I'm speaking about a PROTECT project, uh, which uh, will be aiming on support uh, Ministry of, of uh, Defense. Uh, as well as parliamentary center, which aimed to improve parliamentary oversight uh, in Ukraine. Can you elaborate a little bit more about the purpose uh, of these projects and how Ukrainian institutions can benefit from them and how it can help your Atlantic integration of Ukraine? Thank you. Super. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for the question. And thank you also to our hosts for convening uh, this di these dialogues. Uh, it's a fabulous slate of, uh, of events over the next few days. When Canada convened the Ukraine Reform Conference in 2019, dialogue was a huge part of the three-day event. Uh, and we were all looking forward to Vilnius. Um, now, we know that history has written some uh, crooked lines for us. Uh, and this is how we are continuing to show international support for reforms in Ukraine. Ukraine, uh, and we all still uh, uh, look forward to uh, being part of the in-person glory of a URC in, in Vilnius. Um, you've asked about two specific projects, and I'm happy to speak to them, but I, I, I would like to speak to something deeper and, and what actually underpins those specific projects. Support to the Ministry of Defense in the development of, uh, of strategies and civilian-led uh, policy development. Um, and support to the Rada committees looking at defense security intelligence um, uh, uh, and law enforcement functions. Um, Canada's support in these ways is, uh, is fundamentally comes from a belief that the 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 structures of Euro-Atlantic security um, uh, function well because those 
structures are based, are founded on some strong values. And there are strong values that underpin those projects. Um, I think that, uh, that for Euro-Atlantic integration in the national security area to function well and to be successful, efforts need to have the foundation at its objective not necessarily the military committee of NATO or, uh, or the, uh, a map or the NATO-Ukraine commission. For NATO, that foundation is eloquently stated in, in Article 2 of the Washington Treaty, which speaks to the broader goal, the essential goal of the alliance, which is the development of peaceful and friendly international relations by strengthening their key institutions and by promoting conditions of stability and well-being. Fundamentally, it's an alliance that is first and foremost political, and that's because it is about defending and, ad and advocating the ideas of democracy and free democratic institutions. So practically speaking, what does that mean for leaders of reform in the Rada and in the Defense Ministry and in, uh, in civil society? It means keeping a keen focus on building your reforms within the values that are at the heart of the Euro-Atlantic Alliance, at the heart of Euro-Atlantic peace and stability, these values that lead to peaceful societies. I'm gonna elaborate on one in particular and run through a few others. And each of these is present in those projects that you've spoken about. First, gender equality. You may have heard it a hundred times, and I'll tell us, I'll, 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 I'll let you hear it a hundred and first time. But gender equality is the number one predictor of peace, more so than wealth, more so than the level of democracy, more so than religious identity. When men and women enjoy equal equality of opportunity, of access, of rights, of protection, society is more inclusive and it's more stable. The higher the gender equality, the uh, higher gender equality means lower likelihoods of resorting to violence to resolve conflict. The larger the gender gap, the more likely a country is to be involved in inter and intrastate conflict. Peace agreements are more likely to be reached when women's organizations are involved. To the extent that defense and security is a microcosm of society, gender equality ought to be a mainstreamed concern and objective in all defense reforms. It ought to be a mainstreamed concern and objective in how the Rada looks at, uh, at defense and security institutions and, the fun and their functions. Secondly, another value, democratic accountability. The decisions to use the military tool and to dedicate the state's resources, the people's resources to it, these are political decisions for which elected authorities must be held accountable. And parliament's role is key here. And like you said, we'll be working with uh, the Parliamentary Centre of Canada. We'll be working with the Rada uh, on a, in a $1.3 million project to enhance their capacity to fulfill that very important function. Third is good governance, including transparency in how contracts are awarded, in how, how strategies are set, in how plans are laid. And it means independence, real independence of the key institutions of the state Whose, whose, whose influence, whose, whose role in the stability of a country are so fundamental that they can't be left to the political, they can't be subject to, the, to political winds. And then there's the rule of law and there's no need to explain that. In short, it's not so much the structures that matter as the values that underpin these structures. And I guess I would end just by answering the question, do we see this happening? And I would say yes, in Ukraine, we see it, all the intentions are there. There's a new Women, Peace and Security National Action Plan that's going to be coming out uh, from Vice Prime Minister Stefanishina. There's an active lobby of women's veterans striving to make policy changes and they're making small progress. There are good plans for Ukrobronprom. The Rada, the Rada Committee is open to doing a more effective job. There are procurement advisors in the Ministry of Defense and they've been welcomed but we're also seeing forces that obstruct that good work or priorities that in their vagueness leave opportunities for, for other interests to manipulate money and resources. 
We see a very superficial understanding still of gender equality and not enough of a concerted effort to breaking down barriers. So our PROTECT project, which will work with the Ministry of Defence to identify key projects that need to be planned for, strategized, and, and, and bring the whole institution into implementation, um, the PROTECT project will work on some of the key priorities that are linked to these specific values that are that are that are uh, that will inculcate these values in the institutions so that Euro Atlantic integration can happen and that integration and national security will happen if those values that brought NATO and the EU together are deeply ingrained and consistently in evidence here in Ukraine. Thank you. Uh, okay, uh, I have a next question to Mr. Ambassador uh, Valdemaras. Uh, dear Ambassador, a couple of days ago you said that uh, during uh, Lithuania's second presidency uh, of the Council of the European Union, which will take place in 2027, uh, the European Union could already declare Ukraine a, as a candidate to Euro European Union membership. So, uh, take into consideration current reforms, progress, which you can see right now, seven years just to obtain candidacy is optimistic, pessimistic, or realistic scenario? And what are your projections about NATO membership for Ukraine? Thank you, Deteras. Thank you very much. Um, uh, good, good evening to everyone. Uh, I think it's a realistic scenario, and uh, you know, I, I would love to say the, uh, to, to say the same about about uh, Ukraine's uh, membership in NATO, because, you know, looking from a side, uh, there may be a natural question why, why Lithuania pays uh, so much attention to the support of Ukraine's uh, defense transformation efforts, your integration to NATO. And, you know, the answer is also related to the fact that at times when we, with the help of the Western countries, we have reformed our defense system according to the NATO standards are not too far behind. Uh, I myself was directly involved into this uh, NATO integration process. You know, frankly speaking, uh, back then, even our greatest uh, supporters and biggest optimists did not believe that Lithuania, as well as two other Baltic countries, could become the members of NATO. And I remember when our president uh, in 1994 addressed officially the NATO leadership expressing our strong will to seek NATO membership. Even quite a big part uh, of our friends and allies in the West saw this as, uh, I don't know how to say this, how to put this more gently, you know, so as an unrealistic dream. Nevertheless, it took about 10 years for us, for our efforts to be successful. In 2004, uh, all three Baltic countries became the members of the World Strongest Defense Alliance. So my dears, nothing is impossible. And I sincerely hope the same that, I don't know, in 10, 12 years, uh, who knows, maybe even faster, we as NATO members will congratulate Ukraine, not as our uh, active partner, but as our active true member. Uh, that's why, you know, the most important task today is, is to patiently do your homework, uh, homework and do it well. Uh, of course, it will take time. Uh, because the most difficult part uh, than uh, transforming system uh, is to change culture, to change, to change habits. But you know, you, pr the process is going on. Uh, you have a, a solid basis. It's truly great that Ukraine's uh, goals of NATO membership uh, are clearly established in your, in, in your constitution. And this serves as a strong uh, and solid basis to move forward seeking to implement uh, this in practice. Uh, we're also glad to see the reassurance of Ukraine's Euro-Atlantic goals in the recently adopted national security strategy. We welcome your strategic objective uh, of receiving membership action plan. 
Uh, and of course, uh, you recently obtained new status in NATO as enhanced opportunity partners status uh, without any doubt also facilitates deeper, will facilitate and facilitates already deeper cooperation with alliance and, and uh, opens uh, up access to information, to interoperability programs, uh, common exercises and so on and so on. Yes, so uh, Ukraine's Euro-Atlantic aspirations leave no doubt uh, to its friends, uh, partners, as well as to its enemies. And we truly undertake to help you do that. And there is no doubt that Lithuania, uh, we are true advocates uh, for Ukraine's integration to NATO. Our diplomats are fighting uh, for Ukraine. Uh, uh, maybe fight is not uh, too strong word <laughs> in the corridors in Brussels, in Washington, DC. Our military instructors and advisors are assisting practically uh, on the ground here in, in Ukraine, in Desna, Yavoriv, Ochakiv, Berdichev uh, for some years now. And today, uh, Lithuanian military training mission in Ukraine continues in its full capacity despite uh, coronavirus challenges. And, and as I have already mentioned, our public support at, at, at home for Ukraine is, 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 also, is also very, very, very huge. So we, we encourage uh, our Ukrainian colleagues to continue with the implementation of the defense reforms, especially reforms that provide systematic change. In this regard, I would strongly recommend the Ministry of Defense to continue the professional military education and human resources management reforms, which are assisted by Lithuania and other allies, because I, and I'm sure uh, in that the biggest key to success is right and bright people. Uh, people who drive and manage the change of a country, people with relevant education, people with good English language skills. That's why I propose to pay a lot of attention to, how to say, to staff selection, to the formation of this critical mass which uh, will be able for reforms. And the main goal is to have people who, in, in addition to being loyal, uh, are also able to implement complex reforms. Because we all understand perfectly that, how to say, only changing the names on the doors of the office, uh, of course, is not enough. Uh, so, uh, Yes, if, if you allow one more minute, one more point on interagency inter inter uh, coordination. It is natural that since NATO is a political military organization, uh, when the issue comes to the integration process, of course, the biggest share of responsibility goes to the MOD, uh, other institutions of national security, Minister of Foreign Affairs. Nevertheless, we all understand that a whole country joins NATO, not a single institution. That's why it's so important good coordination. It means that the alliance is being taken into account all the issues, starting with general political stability, economic growth, uh, rule of law, and ending with freedom and rights in the country of accession. So, as defense reform process is gaining momentum, we all see. So my wish is, you know, uh, not to slow down and even increase the efforts. And uh, of course, uh, still a lot of problems, challenges, and tasks uh, which need to be resolved. But after having resolved them, you will be deemed, deemed uh, for success. And we, as your partners, uh, faithful partners, will always be ready to help and assist you. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, my next question uh, would be to Mrs. Uh, uh, Christina Quinn, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the US representative in Ukraine. Uh, dear Mrs. Quinn, uh, what is the greatest challenge of transatlantic integration you can see right now? Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I'm happy to address that question, and I would, I would actually answer equally daunting challenges uh, to full Euro-Atlantic integration for Ukraine. And until those challenges are overcome, we are not going to be able to, Ukraine will not be able to achieve that integration. Uh, 
So first of all, external challenges. Uh, externally, Ukraine is fighting against Russian aggression on multiple fronts. Russia's occupation and attempted annexation of Crimea, the Russian-led conflict in the Donbass, cyber attacks and disinformation spread both from Russian territory and through Russian-directed Ukrainian proxies, some of whom sit in the Rada even today. But Ukraine's challenges are not all external. Internally, the fight against corruption and vested interests is equally important and is vital to resisting disinformation. President Zelensky came into office with a mandate from the Ukrainian people to fight corruption and make the Ukrainian government work better for average Ukrainians. And he's made some progress at that. He's lifted legal immunity for RADA members. He's passed banking reforms and land reforms. But as we know, when reform and rule of law threaten power, privilege, and money uh, that flow to vested interests, those vested interests fight back. And that's what we're seeing today in Ukraine. Oligarchs are further co-opting RADA members, judges, and others to undermine the president's agenda and ensure that the system remains rigged in their favor. We're seeing some vested interests joining with Russia and Russian proxies to spread anti-Western narratives, particularly through their media holdings and social media. So one narrative that we've seen this year that's been propagated by these voices is uh, the suggestion that Western partners are trying to externally manage Ukraine's internal affairs. This narrative, uh, in our view, is particularly dishonest because it basically turns reality on its head. Assistance and support by Western partners, including many of the folks who are on this panel, is provided at Ukraine's request in support of the stated goals of the Ukrainian government and the Ukrainian people. It's fully transparent, it's posted on all of our websites and social media, and it's available for public review and comment. Conversely, I would argue that certain vested interests are the ones attempting to externally manage Ukraine. Their primary goal is their own personal enrichment, achieved by any means possible, including bribery, coercion, and even joining with outside forces that wish to see Ukraine's Euro-Atlantic integration fail, ultimately. So the path to defeating these forces lies with strengthening the institutions that hold vested interests to account for their attempts to subvert the will of the Ukrainian people. Under the Zelensky administration, the Prosecutor General's office has undertaken reforms to ensure that prosecutors serve the Ukrainian people rather than vested interests. And President Zelensky has recently committed to broad judicial reform, which would make an enormously positive impact on rule of law in Ukraine, bring Ukraine in line with European norms, and create an environment more attractive to foreign investment. So fighting two wars simultaneously against Russian aggression and against the vested interests that want to keep Ukrainian wealth for themselves is extraordinarily difficult. But the United States uh, is committed to continuing our work with President Zelensky, the RADA, independent institutions, and civil society to achieve Ukraine's own constitutionally enshrined goal of full Euro-Atlantic integration. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to, as we continue with our foreign partners, uh, do we have uh, Mr. Alexander Vinikov right now uh, online? Yeah. Uh, happy to see you uh, with us. Uh, dear, uh, dear Mr. Alexander, uh, the NATO liaison office is deeply involved uh, into cooperation with Ukrainian institutions in order to, uh, uh, on INP, annual national program, Ukraine NATO implementation uh, and development. Uh, so uh, it was really interesting to ask you how you can describe your cooperation with Ukrainian institution today uh, and what priority reforms can you highlight out of annual national program for, for this year and for next year? Thank you very much um, for the question and for the invitation <clears throat> to join this uh, very timely event. Um, it's a pleasure and a privilege to be with you. Um, in response to your question, I think um, 
I can I can say with confidence that um, the cooperation that NATO has uh, and the NATO representation here in, in Kiev has with Ukrainian partners um, has gone from uh, strength to strength over the past years as Ukraine has as Ukraine has embarked uh, on the path of Euro-Atlantic integration and the reforms that come come with it. Um, <clears throat> I would probably um, highlight indeed the uh, annual national program of Ukraine under the NATO Ukraine Commission, which remains Ukraine's key instrument to get closer to NATO. And uh, allies who uh, assess Ukraine's implementation of the ANP every year, uh, they agree that uh, over the past few years, um, Ukraine has made significant progress in using that instrument and maximizing the, the utility of the ANP as a strategic reform roadmap. Um, the, um, the ANP has uh, really become a much more focused, uh, a more um, strategic, a more structured and, and a more measurable uh, instrument, uh, which, um, which has benefited from uh, advice uh, and capacity building that we have contributed to through our professional development program, uh, training key Ukrainian civil servants involved in the ANP process. Um, our Canadian allies have uh, also had a, a very significant contribution through an ongoing project uh, that, um, that, that assists Ukraine with the development process uh, of the, the ANP. Um, and as we speak, um, NATO HQ is now finalizing the assessment of Ukraine's progress in implementing this year's ANP. And this assessment will be shared with the Ukrainian government soon. Um, I think um, in response to your question uh, again on priority areas of reform, uh, I would obviously uh, highlight security and defense. Um, and here I can mention the um, adoption of the new national security strategy, which uh, was welcomed by NATO. Um, we believe that it will help guide further reform of the security and defense uh, sector in the years ahead. And it will also provide a baseline um, for a number of strategies and uh, other security and defense planning documents, such as the military security strategy and the strategic defense bulletin. And uh, our advisors are working closely with the Ministry of Defense working groups on the development of these key documents. We um, are also aware of the MOD's key reform projects uh, and are looking into possibilities to support these lines of effort with allied expertise and knowledge. And we have also uh, launched the development of a new package of partnership goals under the NATO PFP planning and review process. Uh, this PARP process remains an important aspect of our cooperation, uh, which allows, which will allow Ukraine to further enhance its uh, interoperability with NATO armed forces. I would also like to highlight um, what I would consider a very um, effective uh, relationship, working relationship with the Verkhovna Rada Committee on National Security, Defense and Intelligence. Uh, our advisors are closely engaged in uh, work uh, at the working group level um, with uh, parliamentarians um, and outside experts. Uh, we have been contribu contributing to the development of the uh, of all secondary legislation that is meant to uh, implement the law on national security, uh, which was of course adopted in 2018. Now this law on national security has, uh, I would say two key NATO and Euro-Atlantic uh, principles embedded, uh, which is uh, civilian control and democratic oversight over security and defense. Uh, and so this year, uh, Ukraine scored a significant success in adopting a new law on intelligence. Uh, we believe it's an important step towards ensuring that uh, intelligence services work with greater accountability and oversight. Um, the other 
big line of effort this year uh, and has been uh, relevant for the past few years is the reform of the security service of Ukraine, the SBU. Uh, the transformation of the SBU, of course, is uh, crucial in our view um, to ensure that Ukraine and the service are more capable to defend uh, themselves against uh, fundamental threats uh, in a manner that is consistent with the law on national security and with uh, democratic principles that I just mentioned. Uh, now, the current version of the draft law on the uh, SBU uh, is, contains a number of important improvements uh, as compared to previous ones that uh, NATO advisors and other international advisors working hand in hand have, uh, have seen and reviewed. Uh, at the same time, we uh, believe further work is uh, required on this draft uh, to enhance the consistency of the reform with your Atlantic norms, principles, and best practices. Um, and the final area of reform that I would uh, mention here is the defense industry uh, reform. Uh, and uh, very soon, in a couple of weeks, uh, there is going to be a regular meeting of the NATO-Ukraine Joint Working Group on Defense Technical Cooperation, which will review the status uh, of this reform uh, following, of course, the adoption of the significant uh, legislation on procurements, uh, defense procurements, which we also welcomed earlier this year. Uh, let me now uh, conclude with a, a few remarks on uh, what we see as being key to success on Ukraine's Euro-Atlantic path, uh, which uh, also my Canadian, US and Lithuanian colleagues uh, referred to. Um, I think the first thing I'd say is that it's... Uh, very positive that there is a, a true understanding and acceptance of the need to travel this path uh, as is enshrined in Ukraine's uh, constitution. Ukraine has accomplished a lot since the revolution of dignity, uh, but more work clearly still lies ahead. To consolidate Ukraine's democratic institutions, to strengthen the rule of law and to fight against corruption, further reforms are essential both to bring Ukraine closer to its European and transatlantic partners and to build uh, security and prosperity for all Ukrainians. As with all successful change initiatives, it's crucial that to articulate realistic goals that can be measured. And the development of ambitious strategic visions need to be followed up with robust implementation plans. Successful reform is always holistic and it must involve stakeholders across government who have a clear understanding of strategic goals and direction. Ukraine, of course, is embarked on an ambitious reform track while simultaneously managing an ongoing conflict uh, resulting from an external aggression, a global pandemic, and economic challenges. That is why clear prioritization of reform goals becomes even more crucial in the current context. What I can say for sure is that NATO will continue to stand by Ukraine, both politically and practically, and we will continue to advise, assist, and work together with our Ukrainian partners uh, to help create the conditions for lasting peace and security. I will uh, end my remarks here and uh, hope uh, to be able to participate in the further discussion. Look forward to that. Thank you very much. Yes, of course, I think we will have some questions from the audience in the end. And um, right now I'd like to address uh, And now I will switch to Ukrainian and I will ask the representative of the MOD, Mr. Bunik, who is the, the director of uh, the Department of Military International Cooperation. Mr. Alexander, the MOD is playing a significant role uh, in uh, implementing uh, AN and is one of the key drivers of Ukraine uh, to the uh, Euro-Atlantic integration. Would it be so kind uh, to assess uh, the progress uh, of the uh, MOD um, the implementation of uh, ANP and what are the plans for the next year? Thank you for the question. First of all, I'd like to say that the European integration uh, uh, for the MOD is 
the key uh, driver and forward uh, of the uh, effective uh, changes. If we speak about 2020, it's a special year from two points of view. That's the last year of, of uh, the first stage of uh, the defense reform. Uh, secondly, we uh, have uh, the existing uh, threats, but one uh, another threat added uh, the pandemic, uh, which uh, complicated uh, our collaboration with partners, and we had to find new formats of uh, collaboration. But despite this, 2020 uh, is the year when the, uh, we should uh, have uh, the assessment. I will speak about the key uh, elements which are crucial for the MOD. If we look back at uh, 2016, uh, to see uh, the stage uh, where we were and compare with where we are now. So uh, the great volume of work uh, has uh, been conducted. If you remember 2016, uh, the strategic bulletin was uh, adopted uh, with uh, a number of ambitious uh, goals. And now we can uh, claim uh, uh, with uh, pride that uh, part of those goals were uh, fulfilled uh, and fulfilled at full. Uh, then uh, the joint command was introduced. Now the MOD is coming closer to the structure uh, with the civilians included, which uh, could formulate the policy and also conduct the civilian control. Uh, the armed forces uh, also were reformed, the functions uh, of the general uh, staff and the uh, army commander uh, was uh, divided. And uh, now we have switched to uh, J structures and we are improving the structure uh, that uh, they are similar to the, the uh, J structures in other countries. Uh, then uh, the chain forces uh, were uh, established also the uh, medical forces, the logistical forces. In 2016, uh, we could have dreamt uh, only about this uh, to implement all uh, those uh, steps. And But now we can see that this is, is the reality which uh, should be further developed. And as a result uh, of those uh, changes in the management structure, we could state that uh, this year, uh, there were uh, jo uh, joint uh, trainings to check uh, the capacity uh, of the joint command, how uh, they could uh, use all the capabilities to uh, oppose the, the aggression. Uh, our international partners were also involved in those uh, trainings and uh, there were more than 12,000 uh, military men who participated and a number of uh, NATO uh, states uh, participated in those trainings. Also, in the strategic defense building, there was another goal which was uh, of high importance. It's a factor which uh, is a game changer and it's the uh, introduction uh, of the uh, planning and uh, HR management. The defense uh, planning uh, built on the capacity uh, and it's a new tool to for planning. The Ukrainian uh, party learned this um, and we uh, have drafted uh, a significant number of uh, doctrinal documents and now it's being implemented uh, in the capacity building the new strategic building which is now being drafted and which uh, Mr. Alexander already mentioned, it will be different from the one which we have active right now. The bulletin of 2016 was uh, about the reform mainly, about the factors which would be game changers uh, to change our system. The strategic defense bulletin which is now being drafted is uh, will be balanced between the capacity building and uh, institutional development. So it will be at the background uh, for the development um, of uh, different uh, uh, functions, uh, areas, uh, uh, cyber uh, 
uh, Navy air areas. So it's a new approach, new ideology, and uh, besides the, the capacity-based uh, planning, we will uh, also uh, use the risk management and project management and internal uh, audit, internal control. The third element which I would like to focus and underline to compare the 2016 and 2020, what we used to have and what we now, that the procurement system, the MOD, received uh, the right and gained the capacity uh, to have the uh, external uh, uh, procurement. And this year we already had uh, those procurements and we have uh, those ships uh, island and uh, uh, javelins. And as well, we procured uh, the uh, fight modules uh, for armored vehicles. These are the steps that are very important because the Ministry of Defense is trying to be very practical in implementing this very ambitious task that had been set yet in 2016. Part of those procurements were open for private for the private sector. Yes, indeed, we still have a lot of work to do, but this is another step forward that we've already taken and we've made this progress very substantially. These are probably the three key things that I wanted to underline. Of course, I could tell you about more, such as the new military ranks for NCOs and officers, as well as generals. We also introduced positions of gender, uh, assistants or advisors, that will contribute to better gender equality in the armed forces and many other things were incorporated. Speaking about where we're moving towards and what our challenges are, I'd like to come back to the law of Ukraine on national security and defense. Uh, it actually outlined the standards that we have to be aligned with, and primarily those are military security standards. We actively engage advisors as well as other Ukrainian, I mean, Ukrainian experts. The, the, there is also a strategic defense bulletin. There are other objectives that we will be performing in the next five to 10 years, because a lot of projects will have a longer span than just five years. Today, we are trying to update our comprehensive support package for Ukraine. This is a very important paper in support of Ukraine's reform process. Uh, this also includes the reforms that are part of the mm, ANP. Ukraine has implemented the approach of one country, one plan. So in accordance with this methodology, Ukraine was one of the first part partner nations that will be following this methodology. And we're going to be revisiting the entire toolkit that NATO kindly provided to us for the capability assessment and for professional personnel training, building integrity, as well as other tools that will allow uh, pushing the reforms forward. This is an important thing that will help us achieve the intended goals and use the tools that are provided by our partners. EOP, this is a new format of our relationship with NATO. It's creating a lot of new opportunities. So we're already thinking about how we're going to use and take advantage of the opportunity next year, which undoubtedly is a two-way street. Not only we can 
build on our capabilities and getting closer to the membership, but also invest our more efforts for the benefit of the entire alliance. We're going to increase uh, our presence in uh, the NATO HQs. I mean, our officers will be commissioned there, seconded there. We would also like to expand this framework and continue to share, expand sharing information, including sensitive information with the allies and be involved in broader uh, exercises, not only in crisis management, but also e efficient defense. We're going to be actively working on this so that next year we're not just having the new uh, scope, but also the new quality of our engagement. This year, I think we've had a very good situation. We've, we have the new national security strategy. Soon we're going to have the national um, military strategy. We received the status of e EOP. And also we received uh, another facility from the United States in the second half of this year. So we're trying to actually already encourage um, even more items on our defense reform next year. So everything that's been done at this point is not a full stop. We understand those results have to be maintained and multiplied. With a lot of enthusiasm, we're gonna, going to move forward. Thank you, Alexander, for this very comprehensive answer. Uh, we are joined by Mariana Bazuha, member of parliament and co-chair of the Committee on National Security, Defense and Intelligence. Here's my question to you. Since our last discussion at such a forum, it's, it was in uh, February la last time this year. Since then time, Ukraine has made considerable progress in some of the priority areas, namely I'm talking about the dis defense procurement legislation as well as other, other initiatives uh, encouraged by the Security and Defense Center. And now there are other Euro-Atlantic initiatives on the agenda that will make Ukraine closer to NATO. Uh, we're speaking here about uh, the new uniforms and other initiatives. What can you tell us about this work and what's your vision about the parliament's next steps uh, for better Ukraine's integration to NATO. Hello, everybody. I'd like to welcome everybody who I can see and probably cannot. Nevertheless, it's good that we at least have an opportunity to be speaking online here. This is kind of wrap up event, or maybe one should say this is an interim event today because the, the one we had Last year was mainly focused on the plans, and now we're already considering the defense procurement legislation, and, and it's going to come into force into force as of the first of January 2021. And uh, next year we're going to have this transition from the public defense procurement to the new system, which will incorporate planning and uh, other other. Um, areas of work that, that are going to be actually functioning in a brand new way. Plus, some more bills are in the pipeline after the previous convocations, Parliament, they had actually initiated the process of the new NCO ranks. And plus, we have to, to, to settle the issues, those OF ranks for officers now these legislations have come into force since the first of october this year also i'm going to mention something about intelligence the law on intelligence was already signed by the president and now we are working on those different secondary legislations to actually cover some of the more important aspects but intelligence is not only about settling this specific uh area, which has never been done in our history before. 
we will have to actually encourage some of the new bills and legislations to replace the old ones. But this is also about the parliament's oversight because the draft law on the state security service and intelligence legislation, I'm going to speak about the future plans a bit. They actually, they're about much stronger civilian control over special services and that oversight mechanism has to be also work more intensively from the parliament side so there's there will be a special um especially tasks committee that will be involved in uh, the state security service and intelligence services oversight so there is now an opportunity to set up such a committee and we'd had that opportunity even in the previous parliament's convocation and definitely it's going to be available for the next convocation of parliament so we already started, in fact, uh, setting of the committee after we elaborate on the second component of this reform agenda. So we need to actually pass this law on special services, as well as the SBU legislation. It's not just a siloed piece of law which will be replacing another one. No, it's a comprehensive one. It's going to replace two major legislations that um, the state security service is governed by, and also 36 other um, laws will be amended to have everything aligned properly with this initial idea. The, the, there will be a specific legislation on counter intelligence and also there will be other pieces of legislation on civil service and changes to, to the budgeting process so this is also one of the priorities we already passed the first reading of the law on military uh, recruiting offices um, so we are getting this bill ready for the second reading already so we're not going to have those voyenkomats like in the past so those military drafts uh, uh, drafting offices we're going to have the drafting offices of the new of the new shape and kind it's quite a massive legislation i mean it's uh, it also pr pr presumes some other amendments will be some other laws will be amended once it passes the committee i mean it's going to be ready for the final vote and the parliament and this is going to be the second reading as for the sbu legislation it already passed the committee and now it, is, it was elaborated and changes were made by the committee. We had many different versions from the president's office. There was one and also there was another one offered by the state security service. So we had to do a lot of work to put them all together. And um, given this massive and essentiality of this reform process on the national security in this national uh, security reform agenda. The process between the first and the second reading will not be too fast. I think the participants of this discussion will be very much interested in hearing more about this, but um, we distributed this new bill to our partners. We sent one to the NATO liaison office, to also to the U.S. Embassy and Ministry of Defense and National Security Defense Council in order to collect as much feedback as possible so that between the first and the second reading, we could elaborate some of the changes and amendments and then have it successfully passed through the parliament in the second vote. Because the first reading is just the foundation, isn't it? I mean, it's the just the first part. Um, uh, where some of the main provisions are initiated, but now we need to think in a more in-depth manner how the um, bill is to be looking like as it is submitted for the second reading. 
So we want to build more capabilities for the state security uh, service. There will be, um, for instance, well, they will have the capacity to investigate corruption related crimes, also involve themselves in criminal proceedings. Oh, so sorry, Th those functions will go to the other law enforcement agencies, but the state security service will primarily be responsible for counter intelligence uh, in this broad spectrum of so many different functions. They will be responsible for and then protecting the state and the state secrets. Now, uh, regarding the legislation about the state secrecy, uh, that's a very specific subject, and it is priority three, let's say. So everything that the working group is now working on um, then will be then put together. And after we pass the first reading on the SBU law, then we will just cascade down everything Sorry, the first one is the intelligence law, then the SBU law, then the third one will be the um, state secret legislation, secret secrecy legislation. We're going to also introduce amendments to the um, criminal code and criminal procedure code. Right now, all those initiatives are submitted, and uh, together with the law enforcement committee, we're working together. Um, so all this work is very, very important, especially for the. In as for the intelligence officers, it's more about protection of them. We introduce some new concepts into those bills. Also with references to the criminal code and criminal procedure code. Uh, and we have narrowed the jurisdiction as well for investigative activities. So it's going to be a transiting time, and this change of jurisdiction will be related to the jurisdiction of national security without any jurisdiction for investigating economic and business-related crimes, unless this has to do with the issues of national security. Okay, there are a lot of nuances there. I can speak for hours about this reform, but I'm sure our team will succeed in this, given we have worked on this for the whole year now, and this is quite a difficult piece of work for us, because in fact, since 1991, Ukraine had never had any opportunity to reload all this work and relaunch something new. So this had very adverse effects on the country. You still remember the situation we encountered back in 2014, because we we had been a lot of infiltrations into our security and defense environments. That's why a lot of government agencies and especially those of military nature were compromised. Um, that means we hadn't had enough done by the Ukraine security and intelligence services, which led to a total failure of those. Speaking about priorities for the upcoming year, and how we're gonna meet next time in on what's gonna be the format. We also have uh, the police reform and territorial defense reform. You're probably aware of what we want to do with that. The draft law is almost ready for, for submission. There's a little thing related to the conflict of interest. I, I, I would put it that way between several agencies. First of all, this is the Ministry of Defense and also the general staff. And there is interdepartmental conflict between the Ministry of Interior and Ministry of Defense. Finally, I hope it's gonna be registered already this year and then in Q1 of the next year, we're gonna prepare it for the first reading and maybe it's gonna be ready for the second. It's gonna depend on how uh, we're gonna launch all these initiatives and how when the draft is ready for the first reading. We're gonna see how we how much we succeed in this, in preparing that for the second reading. 
Of course, there are certain technical things remaining on how to settle some of the important things to implement and enforce those legislations that I was talking about now. This is on the defense procurement and others. When I, when I say launching the law, I mean it's enforcement. It's maybe it will still require some more changes to be made. Not that we're talking about changes uh, globally, but no. But in general, our legislative framework and regulations they're built the way that there are very many things regulated by the law and that's the way it's supposed to be it's a very responsible point of time this is just because we have this continental post soviet legal heritage but we keep finding some of the imperfections as the law gets into force that's why we will still encounter need for even more changes. Let's take an abstract example of some of the EU member states. I'm not going to call their names, but uh, in some of the countries, they could handle all this through the secondary legislations like bylaws. And in our case, this is different. We have to put everything in the principal law. So this is we have what we have, but we still have to be move, moving forward and um, employ some of those available legislative techniques. I already mentioned uh, the civilian and democratic control or oversight. The most painful thing about it, which we haven't yet paid attention enough to, this is something we're try trying to settle in the intelligence legislation. Again, this is going to be the whole package of legislative am amendments. And changes will be made to the legislation that governs the work of parliament. It doesn't only mean that we establish procedures for this special parliamentary committee, but we also reinforce the parliamentary control and oversight through the amendments that we introduce to the parliamentary regulation. This is the law on the parliament's regulation, the law on committees, etc. They are already amended and updated from the standpoint of parliamentary control and oversight, especially this oversight comes to the state security service. I mean, o overseeing the state security service and intelligence services. So looking at this big picture, we plan to think whether more additional changes are needed to reinforce the par parliamentary oversight mechanism. And this is something that I explained to the experts already as well as our international partners. About a year ago, there was a question whether we need a separate law on the parliamentary oversight and control over security and defense sectors. Nevertheless, um, keeping in mind that we have the law and regulation and law on the committees that actually govern the parliament's functioning, at present stage, we decided to f go that way. Okay, by changing the legislation, which sets out the rules for the parliament, we actually finding therefore a solution to actually have those issues sorted. And already next year, as a result of such great legislative work, decisions will be made jointly through additional consultations, whether more changes are needed in the legislative oversight mechanism. Regarding this oversight, I have to confess that we were walking on the verge of constitutionality. Because we had The Constitution only mentions the parliamentary control when speaking uh, word for word, but not oversight. And oversight as a notion is quite challenging in the Ukrainian understanding, so we need to gradually implement that understanding. I'm sure I've spoken a lot, but uh, speaking about priorities for the next year, 
Of course, this is the military police that I already mentioned. The issue was postponed a little bit just because there is very strong interdepartmental and interagency miscommunication, I would put it that way. And the communication and the visions there were fragmented either. So due to the fact that the priorities were highly risky, as our committee was considered that this is about defense procurement, which is about huge corruption risks that we've been facing all the time. And there are also organizational risks there too in the entire security defense sector. This also has to do with the intelligence and special services uh, under the reform initiated by the Ukraine's president. So the priorities were uh, lowered from high to moderate. We, of course, expected the Ministry of Defense would jump in and help us do the job. But uh, here I'm going to move to a limited criticism towards the MOD. The, the thing is that we never received a single bill drafted by the ministry. Of course, there were technical changes, even those that we had been planning for quite a while about the CHOD position, Chief of Defense. So we wanted to urgently kickstart this process to either establish this chief of defense institution or chief of general staff in cooperation with the office of president's office. But in fact, we haven't managed to do this. The items that we expected that the ministry would develop, we never had that. They never did it. Neither the military police nor the territorial defense, nothing came neither from members of parliament nor from the ministry. So the community, the cohorts that are now involved uh, in this work on behalf of the ministry and the parliament will have to consider this issue again and help each other to initiate this process again so that we have very good push forward from the cabinet of ministers and specifically the Ministry of Defense. We were gonna be listening to the um, Minister of Defense tomorrow at the parliamentary committee meeting. He will be reporting on the progress made so far today, sorry, to tomorrow at 10 a.m. And um, I think this is one of the concerns we have. And together with the others, uh, we might, might initiate a replacement of the Minister of Defense. Hopefully we're gonna, not going to get there, I mean, and everything will be all right. But this is still a concern, and tomorrow we're going to be actually listening to the minister ask reports on the progress currently achieved. Nevertheless, I have to mention this without coming back to more specific details, because details may sound very subjectively, but like I already mentioned, I only mentioned the facts that the committee never received any single bills generated by the by the ministry. As for the other transformations that are happening at the ministry, we highly welcome those initiatives and we also appreciate that they are resorting to um, uh, very productive approaches in their institutional capacity building. I mean, they have turbulent times sometimes and they're replacing those people, their, their officials, but uh, there has to be con continuity um, of not only the ministry, but uh, also the entire government to be in line with the goals that we intend to achieve. We already mentioned here the national defense strategy and security strategy, the military strategy. Uh, we need to develop the new uh, strategic defense bulletin. So all those things have to be consistent together. Like I already mentioned, some of the human human resource issues, they do not have to dramatically affect this entire work and the ministry's in-house development as well as development of their capacity and interaction with the other peers. It's important that the ministry continues to work closely with the other actors like the general staff and others, they're all integral parts 
of this entire big reform process. In Ukraine's history, the issue of interaction between MOD and general staff has been always competing. And that competition was sometimes even too strong. When, when we cooperate, through cooperation with our partners, we want to make sure the ministry becomes a civilian authority to actually ease that competition between the two entities, even though it's one single entity, isn't it? So they need to have the clear vision where they're moving to and what kind of objectives that they have in front of them. If you have any questions, I'm gonna be eager to answer. I try to be very concise and short. You've probably seen it and heard it. I just tried to underline some of the most important uh, plans that our committee has. Thank you, Mariana, for a very detailed and honest presentation. We have still three participants and only 20 minutes. That's why I'm not sure that we will still have enough time for the questions, but I'm asking everyone online, please do write your questions. We will choose one or two and uh, ask them. And, and now um, I'm passing the floor to Oleksiy Genshev, who is an acting director general of the government office for coordination of European and Euro-Atlantic integration. Mr. Oleksiy, just recently, the new uh, NAP uh, was over for 2021. Uh, how would you characterize this uh, uh, cycle of drafting and how are you seeing the transformation of this document, which is in fact the uh, roadmap for the Euro-Atlantic integration? Thank you for the uh, question. I would like to um, greet all the representatives uh, here. First of all, I would like to, I cannot agree that it's a, a, a report, uh, it's rather a dialogue of reforms, but not only a dialogue, but also the gathering of information. It's a very important uh, moment. Uh, the issue of interoperability and the exchange of information is very important uh, for uh, the operation. Uh, so our aim is the membership. Uh, that's why we are very happy uh, for this very constructive and open dialogue. Mm, uh, and I would like to thank for the organizers of the event uh, and also to the uh, embassies uh, of uh, Lithuania. I feel uh, that uh, our uh, colleagues have a uh, historic or genetic memory. And uh, I'm very happy that the, the uh, diplomats joined uh, our... I would like to focus on several items. First of all, it's very good that the colleagues from the MOD and from the subcommittee in the parliament, of which are in fact in my head. And it just means uh, that uh, we have this uh, inter-institutional cooperation uh, very productive because I remember very good 2014 uh, or 2015 when uh, this uh, interagency communication or interagency collaboration or was not uh, understood by anyone. And we had uh, the fact uh, that uh, in different ministers, uh, they were drafting different uh, um, uh, documents on the same topic and they didn't know uh, about the counterpart. And now we have a number of working interagency groups and they still cooperate within even uh, the 
lockdown period. So I will try uh, to add what my colleague just uh, left uh, for me. We, and I mean the government, uh, in the context of Euro-Atlantic uh, integration, we are aimed uh, at uh, supporting uh, our collaboration with the NATO uh, allies and uh, partners at a very high level uh, and uh, to have uh, this uh, membership action plan. In June this year, oh, we would like to uh, fill uh, with the, the contact, uh, the extended partnership uh, uh, agreement and we think that we should cover the issues uh, which uh, could be um, we, we should speak about the issues which uh, we could not uh, achieve in other way without uh, this uh, extended uh, plan uh, what about the uh, ANP which is a road map uh, for our further actions in the cabinet ministers, we, we have such a procedure as working on the action plan of the government. And in this action plan, we speak a lot about the reforms. We are setting the tasks and we have to explain what is the aim of the reforms. And I always willing to write uh, two sentences that all the reforms which are happening in Ukraine, all the transformations are happening to achieve uh, the values uh, which exist uh, in uh, the NATO state uh, states or in the EU uh, countries. So for me, uh, the explanation is quite clear and understandable. So about the ANP, it's different this year. And uh, first uh, we drafted it uh, online. We had 93 online meetings with representatives of almost 53 state institutions and enterprises. And it's a huge volume of information. And due to this, we already received the draft for the NNP for the next year. And together with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, we are finalizing this. Uh, so, uh, and it's planned uh, for reviewing in the cabinet of ministers. Our colleagues from Canada are supporting us in uh, this uh, activity and we use the, the methodology, which was never before used in Ukraine, at uh, based management. It's very interesting that the uh, bureaucrats and uh, state officials uh, perceived uh, this method in a very positive way, and I'm very happy for the collaboration. But the evolution of the NP could be an uh, internal process, and maybe uh, we can even uh, write up to two volumes of war and peace. Uh, but we would like to have a concise but very precise document. That's why we are always open to improve the process. So, and we are ready to move from ANP to the uh, map. Um, uh, uh, drafting uh, because uh, our strategic goal is to have a membership action plan. When we are speaking about the strategic vision uh, of uh, the alliance development for next 10 years, now in, in the mass media, uh, there is a reflection process uh, 2030 and the aspirations and the time frame that Ukraine and Georgia could uh, become the, uh, members uh, of uh, NATO, we think that it should be specified in the NATO document. The next point. So if we speak about the ANP, our main goal is 
using the mechanisms of the NPs to uh, make uh, the reforms uh, um, very flexible but uh, efficient. And we are now coming to the statistics. Uh, to, we shouldn't be uh, just showing uh, the statistical data uh, or uh, some uh, graphics uh, for the sake of them. So we are using the work of the Commission of Coordination. And uh, Ms. Stefanishina also believes that this interagency uh, coordination at the national level can be a trigger or a mechanism who would uh, enable uh, this uh, coordination to be as much effective as possible. Besides uh, the process uh, of uh, alignment of Ukrainian uh, legislation uh, to the Equi Communautaire, and we set the package of legislation aimed to uh, Euro-Atlantic aspirations of Ukraine, uh, the defense uh, procurement law on the intelligence, and as it was mentioned by the uh, subcommittee uh, member, uh, there is uh, also a draft law on the reform of the state security service and uh, the state secrecy. And uh, these uh, activities wouldn't be effective uh, without the uh, civil society platform and uh, also our collaboration uh, with them. Uh, it's uh, really important for the cabinet of ministers because as I remember, this collaboration was not uh, that uh, active uh, recent uh, in the last years. We would also like to focus uh, on the importance of the fixation on the stating a uh, in uh, the documents of uh, NATO, the possibility of membership of Ukraine in the strategic, uh, uh, at the level of the uh, ministries uh, of foreign affairs meeting. It's also necessary to strengthen uh, in the Black Sea region uh, collaboration and uh, collaboration of Ukraine in the sustainability and uh, counteraction in the wide range of uh, resilience uh, is one of the topical issues and it's already included in the national uh, security and defense uh, strategy so we are building our strategy around uh, this notion of resilience we saw that uh, this uh, notion is also in the strategic documents of the USA and uh, the UK. And we think that Ukraine is coming uh, closer uh, to defining uh, resilience both uh, for the state and for the uh, citizens as it's a needed uh, comprehensive package of tools and we are ready to share with our experience. Unfortunately, sometimes our experience uh, is a sad one. And we are encouraging our partners from other uh, countries, from NATO states, uh, to uh, participate in a systemic work. I would like to thank to the NATO uh, um, office in Ukraine uh, to thank uh, for their collaboration and for comprehensive approaches in the, in the framework of the P, uh, PFP and framework of um, CAP, ANP. Uh, I'm highlighting uh, the idea that we shouldn't work separately, that we should always collaborate in uh, our drafting different strategies and policies. Thank you, Mr. Oleksy. Unlike the speakers, uh, as a moderator, uh, I just uh, failed uh, because uh, 
uh, we are not uh, in time because Miss Mariana I was asking to uh, let her go. That's why I uh, just giving her the chance of the last word. I am very uh, thankful. I am very happy uh, to see the colleagues with whom we are always uh, collaborating. Uh, it was mentioned that interagency collaboration uh, and interbranch collaboration is uh, crucial. So it uh, may uh, sound in a very simple way, uh, but uh, I am also very thankful uh, to the uh, Vice uh, Prime Minister. But I think that uh, that's uh, the best what uh, have happened with uh, the current environment. And we have perspectives uh, to have some historical uh, steps. And uh, I do believe that we will succeed. Thank you for the organizers, for the moderators, and to our partners whom I can see uh, uh, online for the support uh, for the organization of this event and even for our future work, uh, which will lead to, uh, to cooperation and to development. Of course, uh, I didn't mention it in the report um, about the legislation work, uh, but the Euro-Atlantic integration is our strategic vision. But in the general picture, in big picture, our actions are just part of uh, this plan. And uh, thank you again for uh, once again, thank you for the extended uh, partnership and it uh, gives us uh, new opportunities. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Mariana. Uh, we have two speakers and just very, very small time frame. Uh, first of all, I would like uh, to uh, pass the floor uh, to Olena Trihub, the Secretary General at the Independent Defense Anti-Corruption Committee. So the question, uh, your committee uh, is uh, uh, all the time printing the uh, reports uh, on the anti-corruption and the reports how to minimize corruption risk. So what are the corruption risks which exist and which are the barrier for the Euro-Atlantic integration of Ukraine? What are the priorities and reforms at your mind, to, to your mind? Thank you for your question. Thank you for the RPR that uh, these dialogues are happening uh, on a regular basis and we can uh, check how fast we are moving and thank you for the international partners and also uh, to uh, the um, uh, Lithuanian counterpart who actively participate in organizing uh, these uh, dialogues. It's very important to have this platform to answer those questions which uh, Taras uh, put. I have uh, listened to the representatives uh, of the state institutions. Of course, we are moving forward to the Euro-Atlantic integration, but if to compare with uh, the uh, previous event uh, which we had, uh, but uh, the pace slowed uh, and uh, in some areas even stopped. What do I mean? We believe that one uh, of uh, the biggest success is the adoption of the law on the defense procurement. It was adopted in July this year. And of course, Mariana Bezugla mentioned that in transition provisions, it's indicated that, that it will come into effect from January 2021, 20, uh, but it will not happen de facto, and it will be uh, an amendment that it will start in April 2021 because it's not real to start implementing this law. And why? Because the, the number of working groups should have been uh, established around 20, and which would have drafted the bylaws. And uh, in fact, this group does not exist which should have drafted those 20 bylaws. And you know, uh, another important event is the uh, 
establishment of uh, the new ministry, which is not present here, the uh, minister on the strategic industrial sectors, they should have taken the initiative and to create this working group. So uh, it's called the working group on the reform of uh, the uh, military defense uh, industry and the um, civil society was not uh, invited that uh, this legislation uh, was uh, included in drafting of this uh, uh, law uh, and uh, uh, all uh, the amendments uh, which were submitted uh, by um, uh, our committee were included uh, to the amendment. So uh, we are now uh, anxious uh, that uh, uh, the process uh, of um, reforming uh, in this area is uh, has slowed. Uh, so uh, uh, the center which was first uh, created then was eliminated uh, a month ago. This center could have become the central agency for the procurements. We uh, understand that uh, we are now in the pandemic situation. The MPs um, are um, ill and uh, online is not that effective, but pandemics uh, is not uh, the only reason, but also the political will. Some areas are just uh, blocked, uh, especially uh, those that where some funds and private interests uh, are involved. For example, the reform of the defense industrial and the transformation of the Ukr Oberon Prom, because uh, the law on the corporatization of the Ukr Oberon Prom was submitted to the parliament, uh, but after the Ministry of Strategic Industries was established, the law was uh, reviewed, uh, but uh, it was not resubmitted to the parliament. That's why the Ukr Oberon Prone cannot be transformed. And we can see that uh, some strange things are happening that the ministry exists for more than three months, but they uh, have not received. Uh, 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 the access uh, to the state secrecy, uh, the work in the working groups uh, have not started, uh, and uh, we uh, are still speaking about the topics that they want to uh, manage uh, the enterprises which are dealing with experts or then with the enterprises dealing with avi uh, aviation. Uh, it, it was not foreseen uh, by the reform uh, of the corporatization or the uh, corporate management, um, corporate governance. That's why I would like uh, to ask um, our international partners and also the representatives uh, of the state uh, state uh, powers and the representative uh, of the Ministry of Defense to look critically at this process of reform and to think how we can boost it, um, not to make one step forward and then um, two steps backwards. We do not want to lose what have uh, been achieved. Uh, the civil society uh, was uh, very much involved uh, in the reforming of this uh, sector, but now everything slowed down. We still continue uh, submitting our recommendations and amendments to the parliament, uh, but uh, those uh, huge reforms such as the, uh, the state uh, defense uh, uh, procurement uh, and uh, also uh, the industry, uh, defense uh, industry, uh, we are not involved. Uh, so uh, it's true that uh, that uh, there is a uh, narrative uh, which is a fraudulent one, uh, it, but 
Mr. Zelensky uh, became even a victim of uh, this narrative because uh, to Interfax, uh, uh, in his interview to Interfax, uh, that uh, he is uh, uh, laughing uh, at this narrative, but he doesn't like when everyone thinks in the same way. But in the defense sector and security sector, we have uh, a lot of changes and not everyone is uh, thinking in the same way, but it didn't bring us to some positive outcomes. And uh, the final word I will pass to Mr. Mikhailo. I would like to tell you that there is a analytical report on the main uh, risks uh, of reform in the uh, security and defense uh, sector. And uh, one of uh, the co-authors of this report is Mikhaila Samos. I will ask you to be very brief and to tell us about three um, recommendations which uh, you wrote uh, in this report. Thank you very much. Of course, I do believe that the uh, dialogue about the reforms is a very important process. And when uh, drafting those uh, analytical audits, uh, it's very important. This uh, first document we uh, drafted for the conference in, in Toronto. Now we have already prepared the second uh, version of the recommendation and analysis of risk in the defense and security uh, sector and uh, Euro-Atlantic um, integration to the Vilnius conference, which unfortunately that didn't uh, happen, but hopefully will happen in the future. So speaking about the risks, which could be named uh, as their priorities, so the national resilience would be the first one. It was already mentioned, and I would like to explain what it means because uh, the notion of resilience became uh, one of the key notions in the strategy of Ukraine. So national resilience uh, means in Ukrainian understanding, because there are different definitions of this notion. It means is this uh, common synergetic work of the uh, society and the state uh, counteracting the threats uh, to the national security and uh, sustainable development of uh, the uh, country without compromising with the national interest. So it's a very important notion and very um, even much more important to understand it because it's uh, one of the key aspects of this notion is uh, the uh, involvement of the society and uh, the experience of the Baltic states uh, uh, shows uh, how important it is. Uh, the, uh, our partners uh, from Lat uh, Estonia, uh, uh, Latvia, and Lithuania, they have uh, more than 100 years of experience with uh, NGOs uh, who involve uh, the society to the uh, comprehensive approach. So we're speaking not only uh, about the uh, wartime, but also in uh, the peacetime and in the emergency situations. Taras was speaking about three threats. So the uh, national uh, resilience uh, notion would influence uh, other aspects of implementation of the reform. Olena mentioned uh, that uh, the process slowed down. Uh, my hypothesis would be uh, that we are implementing the Euro Atlantic standards in our life without uh, ruining the uh, Soviet standards, uh, without uh, uh, ruining the Soviet uh, ground. So uh, one paragraph uh, which is linked uh, to resilience and civil and democratic control and involvement of the civil society in, uh, in the security and defense sector. That's uh, the effective model of the armed uh, forces with the professional uh, armed forces and also uh, the uh, voluntarily based uh, support of the society. Uh, 
without the uh, repressive methods uh, of the Soviet uh, Union. And in our center, we believe that still the system of recruitment to the uh, army is uh, uh, typically uh, Soviet based. Those uh, centers of recruitment should be integrated in a different system. Um, or, so when the uh, territorial um, support uh, units uh, should be created with the involvement uh, of the locals. So the professionals should be part of this and they will be uh, they will be ready to act in the new environment and in the new type of warfare, unlike the World War II. That's why in the national resilience notion, we should uh, highlight uh, and we should uh, advertise this notion uh, and uh, explain it uh, and use in the development of the armed forces of Ukraine. Thank you to everyone. Thank you to you. Uh, we had a very uh, fruitful discussion. Uh, we're we're not going to take your time. Uh, have a very good continuation of the conference in the next days. Good afternoon.